Our Father, we pray that you might be with us as we fellowship together. And we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath. I believe it's a blessing that we're in the house of the Lord, amen. Uh, when the sun set today, we entered holy time. And I think that, thank you, Elder, thank you. And I think that if we really understood the nearness of the coming of the Lord, that the meetings that we're having here, we would take them much more serious. As the evangelist said earlier, God knows the difference between a casual contact and someone who is really seeking for a blessing. Don't think that it's accidental that you've just come to these meetings. Don't think that it's just accidental that a meeting like this that is preparing us for eternity is taking place now. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is about to come. And I believe that God is getting us ready. And you see, Satan, he understands something that most of us are not as acquainted with. And the book Education, the messenger of the remnant says that the Sabbath and marriage are indissolubly linked. In other words, you can't separate the institution of the family from the institution of the Sabbath. Now, if we really understood that, we would understand what that means as it relates to the close of probation. You see, Satan has counterfeited everything that God has done. Is that right? And right here, I tell you, in California, the only thing I want to do here is fellowship with you and get out. Amen. This is a wicked city. Your governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, as he has passed laws for gay marriages, gay unions, even to the Supreme Court, you must understand God has defined marriage as one man and what? And one woman. So for the Supreme Court and others to seek to institute a civil union, that's a counterfeit marriage. But Sabbath and the marriage are indissolubly linked. So when we saw Satan seek by legislation to enforce a counterfeit marriage, that should have indicated to us now it's time for him to enforce a counterfeit Sabbath. Because marriage and the Sabbath are indissolubly and his false marriage and his false Sabbath are indissolubly linked. And you and I are living in that time today. And I believe that the greatest thing that Satan can do to prevent us from being prepared to meet Jesus, to prevent us from being prepared for eternity, is by seeking to enter in into the relationships between man and woman, husband and wife, and courtship and marriage. And we're going to prove that from the Word of God tonight. Do you know that God intended that he could look at every Adventist family and hold them up as a symbol of the family above. Did you know that God intended that there never was to be by their own experience, an Adventist never by his own experience was to know anything about a divorce, anything about a separation, nothing about a broken home or a single home, not even a broken heart if we follow God's plan. But the majority of us, even that are members of the Remnant Church, we don't really understand that plan anymore. But I praise God that there's a plan of redemption. That no matter how many mistakes we've made in our individual lives, no matter how many mistakes we've made in courtship practices or marriages, that if we would just come to Jesus, that he could get us ready, what do you say? We're going to be dealing with a subject tonight that we have entitled Marriage and the Last Days. 
marriage in the last days. But before we get into such a solemn message, we want to approach our Lord again. You don't mind praying, do you? No. If you were reverently near with me. And individually and as a family, we're pleading for the Holy Spirit that we might hear Jesus speak to us. Our Father and our God, our Savior and our friend, thou that dwellest between the two cherubim shine forth. We're so thankful that on this Sabbath we have the privilege of having a double measure of thy Spirit. We plead, dear God, that as we have assembled here to open up thy word, not only to hear the theory of truth, but to understand the practical issues of life. We pray that our minds and our hearts might be taken to the most holy place, that we might behold the glorious pattern and vision that has been shown to us in the Mount of God. And that by seeing thy perfect pattern, that we might come down to the valley and build according to that pattern. Oh, Father, there are many that are here tonight that do not know your plan. But we want to know it, Lord. We want to know it better. And we want to be brought in harmony with this plan that will prepare us to meet thee. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would open up our minds and our hearts, that we might be in heavenly places, remove every distraction, gather our minds, and may we recognize the solemnity and yet the beauty of the union and that which leads to the union of marriage. And may we see his relationship in these last days into our lives. And so we ask now for your abiding presence. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, let's notice what the Bible says together. And brothers and sisters, I believe that every one of us has our Bibles. Amen? Amen? Because in order to understand the practical issues of life, in order to understand what God is leading in courtship and marriage and those experiences that are going to prepare us for eternity, we're not listening to the ideas of man. We've heard enough of man's ideas. Is that right? Man's ideas have brought us into the place that we're in tonight. And what we need is to hear from God. We need a revelation from the most holy place. You see, brothers and sisters, we are not living in any ordinary times. We are not living at the beginning of the world. We are living today in the last days of this world's history. This world as we know it is fast coming to the end. And Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24. You know the story. Jesus had just finished rebuking the religious leaders of his day. He turned to the temple that the Jews loved so much and he said, your house is going to be left unto you desolate. 
And when he said that the Jews, those disciples of Christ, had a foreboding of destruction on their minds and hearts. In fact, notice what they said in Matthew 24, beginning in verses 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for the show him what? The buildings of the temple. You see, those disciples, they heard Jesus say that your house is going to be left desolate. And they knew that it meant something that was dangerous toward the temple. And they turned and said, Jesus, but look at this temple. Marvel, you know that that temple was one of the wonders of the world. Herod had embellished it. That temple stood hundreds of feet in the air. Those disciples on Mount Olivet were not looking down at the temple. They were looking straight across. And when the sun set on that temple, inspiration said that it looked as if it was a snow-capped mountain that was made of burnished gold. It was one of the wonders of the world. And those disciples said, look at that temple. Do you mean that this temple, something is going to happen to it? And Jesus in verse 2 said, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here, what? One stone upon another, that shall not be, what? Thrown down. Jesus said, Not one stone would be left upon another. And that's very interesting. You see, brothers and sisters, when Jesus made this statement that not one stone would be left upon another, Jesus made a very startling pronunciation. It was almost like a minister standing from behind the pulpit in America and saying that this land that has once stood for religious liberty would be leaders in religious persecution. It would be as startling as a minister saying that in a United States of America that church and state would unite to enforce a national Sunday law. That was how startling Jesus' words was. The disciples, they could not imagine life without that temple. And so they asked Jesus and they came to him and said, what in the world, when would this take place? How could this happen? Because they reasoned that if the temple would be destroyed, That meant that the world was going to come to an end. And so the Bible says in verse 3, notice what it says. Let's read it together. It says, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be what? The sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And Jesus gave them clear signs. Jesus spoke, brothers and sisters, we're all familiar about the wars and the rumors of wars, and we see the wars in Iraq, and Bush wants to move it to Iran. We see the signs fulfilling just as Jesus said. We see that the Bible says that nation would rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and that there will be earthquakes and diverse places. And in California, I don't have to tell you that these things are taking place. Just the other day, we had an earthquake that took place here. Someone was telling me. They say that every 140 or so years that a massive earthquake takes place, and they say that that earthquake is set for next year. And we are sitting down, and we are seeing these signs, but many of us don't understand that Satan is looking to get into our hearts and do it the worst and the most deceptive way to make sure that we're not ready for eternity. And you know how he does it? The Bible says in Matthew 24 that not only would we see these strange signs, but the Bible says that one of the greatest signs would be the condition of the world just prior to the coming of Jesus. In fact, notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 37. Let's read it together. The Bible says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of what? The Son of Man be. The Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man or Jesus is going to come the second time. In other words, Jesus was saying that when we see the world come into the same condition as it was in in the days of Noah, that we could know that the world was about to come to an end. Now, brothers and sisters, 
We know that the days of Noah were characterized by two great things. You know what they were? Violence and immorality. In the days of Noah, there were not simply homosexuals like we have here in California. They were trisexuals. Man with man, man with women, and man with beast. There was the most bestial and immorality that the world has ever seen, and our generation has equaled the generation as it was in the days of Noah. Never before have we seen violence as prevalent as we see in our large cities and in the United States of America and the world over. And God, by this, is indicating to us that we're living in a time as it was in the days of Noah. The Bible says that when we saw that, that we could know that the coming of Jesus was about to take place and that the last days were not coming, but that the last days were already here. But I wonder what Jesus meant when he said, as it was in the days of Noah. The Bible says in the next verse that we don't even have to guess about it. In Matthew 24, beginning in verses 38, the Bible goes on to say, Jesus preaching now. He says, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were doing what? They were eating and drinking, marrying and what? And giving in marriage. That's enough for just now. Now, we're not dealing specifically with that subject of health, so I'll leave that eating and drinking for another time. But I want to focus in specifically that the Bible says that in the days of Noah that they were marrying and what? And giving in marriage. Now, notice Jesus used this as a sign that they were living in what days? Jesus said, remember the disciples came to him and said, tell us what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And one of those, Jesus said, they would be marrying and giving in marriage. Now, brothers and sisters, that would cause the thinking mind to wonder, what do you mean? Who instituted marriage? Jesus instituted the first marriage himself. How could marriage be a sign of the last days? And this is very significant because there are some that take extreme positions when we talk about the subject of marriage. Did you know that? There are some that are extremists. Now, I did not say that there are some that are called extremists. You see, we are told that those who will reach the standard that God has set, Fundamentals of Christian Education 289, that those who will reach the standard that God has set will be regarded by worldlings as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. They will be called this, but they won't be extremists. They will simply believe what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy says. But an extremist is someone who adds to the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy what God never said. And there are many that are extremists or some that are extremists and they say there should never be marriages in the last days. You know, there's a church in Rome that teaches that that priest, in order to maintain his purity, he has to be celibate. You ever heard something like that? The Bible in Timothy speaks of it as an apostasy of the latter days. It came out of the same Bible that the Sunday Sabbath came from. That Bible from the book of the devil. And so there are some that teach that marriage as itself is not something that can be entered into in the last days. These are extremists. In fact, there are others that go further and say that even children should not be born in the last days. Have you ever heard somebody tell you that? They say in the last days you shouldn't have children. Now let's be clear about this. In the Bible, the Bible holds up and tells us that those who are going to be, be prepared for the coming of Jesus, that they're going to be a group that will even be translated from this earth without seeing death. Is that right? What is the numerical name that we call that group of people that will be translated from this earth without seeing death? What is the numerical name? The 144,000. They are going to be translated from this earth without seeing death, meaning they're going to be alive and prepared for the kingdom to see Jesus come. I want to be a part of that group. How about you? Do you know that we're in that generation today? 
And we should strive with every energy we have to be among that holy group. But now listen. In the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, God has set forth a man by the name of Enoch as a type of that group. Did you know that? Enoch was translated from this earth without seeing death, wasn't he? Now, now I ask you one question. What was the greatest vehicle that God used, the greatest medium that God used to prepare Enoch for translation? I couldn't hear you. Now, remember, we're in a class. I'm not just going to preach. Now, after we get through this introduction, we have to study, brothers and sisters. In the book Evangelism, we're told by the spirit of prophecy that in place of sermons, we need to open up the Bible and these books, line upon line, text upon text, here a little and there a little, because I understand now that there is a generation today that we're here now that we no longer understand the practical truths of godliness, and Satan uses this as an opportunity to destroy us, even those who claim and to understand and believe the truth for this time in the relationship or the arena of relationship, they may seem sensible upon every other subject, but here Satan almost beats them up like a handle, taking that bat and putting it to them on a handle. You see, because if he can't get you one way, he'll try to get us another. Is that right? And so we need to study that. But I want us to see that in this classroom setting, what was it that prepared Enoch the greatest for translation? The Bible says, you can read it when you get home in Genesis 5. The Bible says that it was after he had his first son. So his child literally prepared him for translation. Amen. Which means today that God has set that forth that if it is the will of God, children can prepare us for translation and even to be a part of the 144,000. Now the Bible cautions us. It says, woe unto them that give suck in those days, but it does not say that we should not have children. The Bible cautions those that are marrying in those days, but it does not say that we should not get married. It simply counsels us not to be married or have children outside of the will of God. Are you with me? But if it's the will of God to be married, I, maybe before this session is over, I will share with you some texts that prove that marriage is one of the greatest ways that God will prepare us for the latter rain. Did you know that? One of the greatest vehicles is clear in the Bible. Maybe before this session is over, we'll look at that. But the point is, it is the will of God. So how in the world could Jesus now take this institution of marriage and say that it will be a sign of the last days? How could he do it? We must understand that Jesus qualified his statement not by saying marriage in and of itself would be a sign, but he said, as it was where? In the days of Noah. They were marrying and given in marriage. In other words, the sign of the last days is not marriage. The sign of the last days is not simply being given in marriage. The sign of the last days is giving in marriage and marrying the way they were marrying in the days of Noah. Are you with me? Now, how were they marrying in the days of Noah? Go to the book of Genesis. What book did I say? Genesis chapter 6. We don't have to guess. When Jesus preached, every one of his messages was based on the word of God, and there was no New Testament, was there? So Jesus was preaching from the book of Genesis. And we'll see what Jesus saw. Now this book is right here. It's entitled The Adventist Home. There are three books that I wish that you would have brought with you. I wish I could have told everyone ahead of time that are going to be your textbooks along with our Bibles. Three books that I want you to become well acquainted with as we deal with the subject of courtship and marriage and the practi practical issues of life. Number one, the book Adventist Home. What book did I say? Number two, Messages to Young People. What did I say? And number three, the book Ministry of Healing. Which one? Say those three books with me. Adventist Home, Messages to Young People, Ministry of Healing. If we would study these books on our knees with our Bibles open and with God in prayer, we could build a experience and a preparation that would prepare us for translation. The problem is we have gotten away from these books. And we have picked up books 
from the world that can never lead us to the most holy place. You see, it's only that which came from the most holy place that can lead us back into the most holy place. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to read a statement here. In the book, in the book Adventist Home, page 121. Listen to what the prophet says. Adventist Home, 121, it says, There is in itself no sin in eating and drinking or in marrying and in giving in marriage. It was lawful to marry in the time of Noah, and it is lawful to marry now. When? If that which is lawful is properly treated and not carried to sinful excess. But in the days of Noah, men married without consulting God or seeking his guidance and counsel. Now, did you hear that? In the days of Noah, men married how? Without seeking God or his guidance or his counsel. So the way they married in the days of Noah, which made it a sign of the last days, was that they were marrying not by the counsels of God or by the plan of God or by the precepts of God, but they were using their own ideas and the ideas of Hollywood instead of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And when you and I enter into a courtship or to a marriage or a relationship outside of the counsel or the will of God, we become a sign that we're living in the last days. We become living signposts that say that probation is closing and some of us, it is going to be closed on while we believe that we're in such a beautiful relationship. You see, brothers and sisters, Satan knows how to wear a miniskirt and stilettos. He knows how to do it. And so we must understand God's plan, and we must come back to the ideas, not of men, but of the inspired word of God. What do you say? And so I want to take us there today. Now, I want to read in the Bible what we just read in the spirit of prophecy. Is that all right? Genesis chapter 6, notice what it says. Genesis chapter 6, notice what the Bible says. Genesis 6, remember, as it was in the days of Noah, the sign was they were marrying how they were in the days of Noah. Well, how were they marrying in the days of Noah? Genesis 6, beginning in verses 1. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were what? Were born into him. Now watch the point. Verse 2. That the sons of God saw what? The daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise of all which God chose. They took them wise of all of which God's counsel told them to take. They took them wise of all which what? They chose. In other words, this was not God's choosing. This was not God's consultation. This was not God's way. They were marrying according to their own ways and wills and ideas. They took wives whom they chose. And some of us today, when we think about courtship and marriage, we think it is an experience where we look around the room and say, hey, she's fair, I'll choose her. Or that young man looks good, I'll choose him. But that is a sign of the last days, my friend. It has nothing to do with the plan of God. And so we have to come back now. And we have to see what God's ways is because it is so serious. Do you know that there was much sin taking place in the days of Noah? You know how bad it was in the days of Noah? You read patriarchs and prophets. We are told, brothers and sisters, that nothing was safe, property or possession. Nothing was safe in that time. And every sin that could be done was done so much so that when God saw it, it almost repented him that he made man. But do you know what it was that took the cake? Do you know that when man begin to unite in marriages that were outside of the context of God, he knew that there was nothing else that he could do for man. Did you know that? Notice what the Bible says now. Verse 2 says, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose immediately after this when he saw these ill appropriate marriages immediately now God says in verse 3 my spirit shall not always strive with man do you understand what was taking place God saw man, he saw a man and a woman coming together in a marriage that was inspired by the devil himself. And God saw this and said, when a man and a woman whom Satan has brought together are not following God's plan, God said, there is nothing else I can do for man at that point. Do you know that the greatest thing that the devil can do to prevent us from being prepared to meet Jesus is to get us in relationships, into courtships, and into marriages that have never been ordained by God. And the Holy Spirit himself will look at man and say, I can't do anything else. Now, you don't believe me. I'll read it in plain language and messages to young people. I like the magnifying glass. What do you say? Amen. The message is to young people. Notice what this says. I think this is very, very stupendous. One of the most powerful quotations in all this book. Message is to young people. Notice what it says. I'm going to 450. I'm sorry, 455. It says, Satan, who? Satan is busily engaged in influencing those who are wholly unsuited to each other to unite their interests. Now you must understand, Satan is a matchmaker. Did you know that? Do you know that Satan watches young men and young women and older men and older women and he says, now, how can I bring two people together that don't belong? No, it's, it's more serious than that, my friends. It's more serious than that. Listen, it says, he exalts in this work. What work? What work? Bringing two people together that God never ordained to be together. For by it... He can produce more misery and hopeless woe to the human family than by exercising his skill in any other direction. Would you mind if I read that again? He exalts in this work. It's talking about uniting those who don't belong. For by it, Satan can produce more misery and hopeless woe to the human family than by exercising his skill in any other direction. So you tell me, what do you think that Satan is spending the most time on right now? Bringing relationships together that God never ordained. And there are young women that are in this room tonight that need to break off relationships that they have. Young men that are in this room today, they need to break off relationships because the moment that it would be engaged in, it would mean damnation to the couple that accept it. Shadows that will lift over homes that can never be lifted. And I'm talking about people that seem sensible upon every other subject. Now, I want to look at the flip side corner of that, though. If this can produce the most misery and the most helpless woe to the world, do you know that you can assist God by bringing the greatest happiness to the world? Now that which brings the most misery when rightly directed can bring the most what? The most happiness. If you and I can take time to learn God's plan of relationships and courtship and marriage, we can help solve the problems that are filling this world. You know that the foundational problem in this world is the foundation problem of marriage in the home. Did you know that? That that problem underlies every other in society. If the home is messed up, everything that comes out of it is messed up. The, re the foundation or the beginning of restoration takes place in the home, my friends. And if you know God's plan, then you can be used by God to bring the greatest amount of happiness. Now, let me say this before we go a little further. Now, there are reasons 
If you're single and you're here tonight, obviously you can find help in these studies because it can help guide you in being guided by God because most people are being bewitched by the devil instead of guided by God. Did you know that? When it comes to this subject of marriage and courtship, it is a bewitching power that it holds over the minds of many women. And most people are being bewitched instead of guided by God. But if you will follow God's plan singly, God can lead you. But do you know even for married couples that there's two great reasons why this class is important? Do you know why? Number one, if you have children of maritable age, you can guide them. Is that right? And then there are people that you can influence. There are those that will come to you for counsel, for advice, for instruction, for direction. And if you know God's plan, you can help save many a marriages. There are people that come to me all the time, old and young, and they're having problems in their marriages. And by understanding God's plan, you can direct them to the blueprint of how to have heaven on earth. I've seen people come to me in tears, ready to get a divorce, and when we go back to these books, I've seen them leave with a smile on their faces, happier than anything else that I could do for them. But it comes not by the wisdom of man, but by the wisdom of God. Is that right? And so this is why we want to understand these principles, and tonight is just an introduction. We're going to go deeper tomorrow morning, in morning manner. We're going to build a stair step of success as it relates to these relationships. Every young man, every adult, we can understand it, but the second reason for married couples is even greater than the first. Do you know that the majority of marriages today, even in this world, have not followed God's plan to enter into marriage? Did you know that? In the last page of Messages to Young People, what book can I say? In the very last page of Messages to Young People, Messages to Young People 466, listen to what I get the inspiration from. It says, Messages to Young People 465, it says, young people too often feel that the bestowal of their affection is a matter in which self alone should be consulted. But it says, a few years of married life, how long? Are usually sufficient to show them their error, but often too late to prevent is baleful results. For the same lack of wisdom, the same what? Now we're studying, I want you, to, now brothers and sisters, tomorrow you need to have some notebooks, amen? I see some notebooks. Tomorrow we want some notebooks, we want some pens, we want to be in school to study these books and to understand them. What do you say? Now this says, listen now, this says the same lack of wisdom and self-control. I want you to say those two with me. Wisdom and self-control. It says the same lack of wisdom and self-control that dictated the hasty choice is to per permit it to aggravate the evil until the marriage relation becomes a galling yoke. Many have thus wrecked their happiness in this life and their hope in the life to come. In other words, the same problems that led to an improper marriage aggravates the marriage later on. So if you don't understand God's plan in courtship and you're already married, we need to go back to kindergarten and learn the lessons, don't we? Or else the foundations will be destroyed. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation, what book did I say? Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, notice what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible is clear that in the last days that Satan is doing everything he can to defeat the plan and the work of God. And in Revelation 12, John the Revelator was pleased to present to us Satan's last attempt to destroy the people of God. Revelation 12, verse 17, I believe that we're familiar with this text, but I want us to read it, perhaps to get an application that we may have overlooked before. Revelation 12, 17. And when you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Revelation 12, 17, let's read that together. The Bible says, and the, who's that? That's the devil. Was wroth with the woman, who's that? That's the church. And when to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, this is Satan's last attempt to prevent the people of God from being prepared for the second coming of Jesus. 
And God has been pleased to show us Satan's devices. And it says that he would seek to attack that remnant church that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not talking about every church, is it? This is only talking about one church. There's only one church that believes in all of the commandments of God and at the same time have the testimony of Jesus, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist church. In other words, Satan is not worried about every denomination. Satan is focused on this church because we are the only ones that have a message that can prepare the world for the coming of Jesus and that can cause Babylon to fall. And so Satan has scratched and searched to say, how can I destroy this people? But he's found, Satan, as he studied, he's found that a church is simply made up of families. So for Satan to destroy the church, all Satan has to do is what? Is to destroy the family. Satan is focused on the family. But now, brothers and sisters, do you know what the foundation to the family really is? I mean, think about it. If a man wanted to destroy a building, to demolish this building, would he go for the windows? Would he go for the roof? Would he go for the walls? What must he go for to successfully demolish the building? He attacks the foundation, and so the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalms 11.3. And the foundation of the home is not mother and father. Did you know that? It's not brother and sister. The foundation of the home is the marriage relationship. You see, brothers and sisters, before there was father and mother, there was husband and wife. The primary relationship, the basic relationship, the foundational relationship is husband and wife. And from this too, everything protrudes. The marriage is the foundation. So for Satan to destroy the home, all he has to do is to destroy the foundation, which is the marriage relationship. Are you with me? Now, do you think that Satan is going to wait until you get married to the right person? Or do you think that Satan might start even long before you ever get married? That he might start at courtship and relationship so that he can bring you unto the wrong person because by it he can produce more misery and helpless woe than he can by exercising his skill in any other direction. The Bible says that this is exactly what he's doing. Now, brothers and sisters, this is why you and I must have something. They not only have the commandments of God, but what do they have? No, I didn't hear you say it. I don't know if you have it. What do they have? The testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, brothers and sisters, do you believe that? Do you have in the testimony of Jesus the spirit of prophecy? Do you have in the spirit of prophecy the testimony of Jesus? Then when I read messages to young people, when I read Adventist Home, when I read Ministry of Healing, tell me, am I listening to the words of Ellen White? Am I reading the words of a fickle old woman that didn't know anything but a third grade education? What am I reading when I read these beloved books? You know, somebody has said to me before, they said, oh, pastor, I don't want to read anything but those words that are in red. Just give me the words of Jesus. And I said, well, I'm so thankful that they made this, these little red books. <laughs> because every word in these red books, you know, every word should be read here. You know why? Because every one of them is the testimony of Jesus. They simply forgot to write it in red. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, if we believe that, then we would read those testimonies. We would read Ministry of Healing in Adventist Home, and we would read them with our Bibles because they tell us most interesting things. And I think before we close the meeting tonight, I want to lay one fundamental principle that is the foundation to it all, and we're going to build upon it tomorrow morning. And we're going to go higher and higher and build and show God's plan that leads to courtship and marriage so that we can have heaven right here on this earth. 
a little heaven to go to heaven in, what do you say? You know we can have it. And I tell you this not only by theory, I know it by experience. That you can have heaven right here on this earth, provided we follow God's plan. Now, brothers and sisters, Proverbs 18. What book did I say? I bring to view now a most powerful principle in all that we're going to study. Proverbs chapter 18. What book are we going to? Proverbs chapter 18. And I ask you, you see, in the dating that, that the world calls it today, in the dating of this world, in the courtship that this world carries on, they would even say in this generation, they would tell the young women, you know young women, if you see the man that you want, you better go get him. I wonder if that's God's plan. I'm reading Ministry of Healing. And then we'll read in Proverbs 18. I'm reading Ministry of Healing in the chapter called The Builders of the Home. And in this chapter, we have God's recipe for success in marriage. But now it says this, I want to read this to you, and I want you to listen. Listen. Let those who are count, contemplating marriage weigh every sentiment and watch every development of character in the one with whom they think to unite their life destiny. It says, before, it says, before they link their life destiny, let every step toward a marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and to honor God. And then it says this, listen. Under such guidance, let a young woman accept. Let a young woman do what? I want you to listen to the young, these words. The wording that inspiration uses is very specific. Let a young woman accept as a life companion only one who possesses pure manly traits of character, one who is diligent, aspiring, and honest, one who loves and fear God. Let a young man seek. Let a young man do what? Seek. Now, it said a young woman should do what? And a young man should do what? Seek. Now, what does seek mean? He's the one that's going to look. Is that right? And you seek, you shall find. But the woman, it did not say, let a young woman seek. In God's plan, the young woman is never to seek for a man to be married into. Now, please listen to me. It's much more solemn than this. Because there are many women right now that are seeking, and they get what, what they search after. They get a husband from human perspective, and as a result, their marriage is a little more than hell on this earth. So now, it says that in God's plan, a young woman is never to seek, but she is either to accept or to reject. Are you with me? Now, in the Bible, now this says a young man is to do what? Is to seek. Now, let's read in the Bible what we just read in the spirit of prophecy. Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, and when you get there, let me know by saying Amen. The Bible says very clearly in Proverbs, the 18th chapter, beginning in verses 22. Let's read that together. The Bible says, Whoso findeth a what? Now, who is this, who is this text talking to? It's talking to men, is that right? So the Bible says that a man is to do what? In order to find a wife, the Bible says, Ye shall seek and ye shall... Seek and ye shall... So in order to find, the young man is to seek. It says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Here this Bible text presents the picture not of a woman seeking a man, but of a man seeking a woman. Is that right? Now most people, they say, well, but pastor... I'm 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, and no man has yet sought me. What do I do now? I read to you the words of the testimony of Jesus. You are to accept. You know why? 
Whenever you do something outside of the council, you know who will bring to a woman a man if she seeks? God won't do it because he never tells you to do that. But if a woman will seek after a man, somebody will bring her a man. The devil will bring her a man. And I've seen too many experiences. I know of too many friends that have started out trying to walk in this Christian walk. Some of them have been ministers of God that they have been brought together by the demonic influence. And as a result, some of them no longer walk in the ministry today. I mean, think about it. This has most successfully destroyed more than anything that the devil has done. Tell me something. Who was the strongest man in this world, physically, mentally, and spiritually? Who was the strongest man in this world that you know about? Samson. What was it that Satan used to destroy him? Who was the wisest man mentally? That was physical. Who was the wisest man in this world? What did God use to destroy, Satan use to destroy him? Who was the most, one of the most spiritual men that the Bible said was a man after God's own heart? And what did the devil use? More than any other way, mentally, physically, spiritually, Satan has been successful, and even man when he was perfect, what did the devil use in the Garden of Eden? This relationship between the man and the woman. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why we cannot trust our own opinions. We, brothers and sisters, must go back to find God's plan and be willing to follow it because he who does this obtaineth a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And we must remember, if we're following God, no good thing will he withhold to them who walk uprightly. But now let's get ready to bring it to a close. Proverbs 19. What book did I say? Let me ask you this, and this is why it's most important. Young men, if you are searching for a woman, where should you find her? Down at the club somewhere? Bowling alley? I guess you should go down to the church to find a woman. Is that where you go? Who says yes, you go down to the church and find a woman? Who says no? Now, brothers and sisters, what text in the Bible says go to the church to find a woman? You see, we are doing what we choose. We come to meetings like this in idea of seeking mates because they say, oh, this is a spiritual woman here, spiritual woman here. A retreat like this is not to come to find a husband and wife, my friends. We are here trying to find God's way. And if we will find God's way, he'll take care of what we need. Do you see? If we seek him, in fact, young men, if you're looking for a wife, you know where you're, where you're to go? Proverbs 19, verse 14. Let's read it in the Bible. Proverbs 19, verse 14. Let's read it together. It says, house and riches are the inheritance of what? Of fathers and a what? A prudent wife is from the church. Is where? From the Lord. So that tells us that if the prudent wife, the good wife, the right wife is from the Lord, then if you want that wife, where must you go as a young man? To the Lord. Do you see? Do you see then that if you don't know the Lord, then you can't get the right wife? So before you find a wife, you must find Jesus. Do you understand? You see, there are multitudes that are going to find women and they will find her and they will find the woman that Solomon spoke of in Proverbs 7 whose house leads to hell, the Bible says. But I don't want hell, I want heaven. What do you say? And the way to find that woman, we have to go to the Lord. Young men, if you came here and searched for a wife, you're in the wrong place. But if you were down on your knees, go to the Lord, then we can have heaven on earth. What do you say? But now I address the question to young women. Young women, if you believe that God wants you to get married, what should you do? Go out and search for a man? What should you do? Think about it. If God gives to a man a woman, where must the woman be whom God gives? 
They must be in the Lord, right? God could not give a young woman from him to you unless that woman is his. Are you with me? So the prudent wife is from where? From the Lord. So if God is going to give that woman to the man, then that means that that woman must already be in the Lord if she is going to be given to that man. Are you following me? God will never cast his pearls before swines. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why that whether we're a man or a woman, we must put ourselves where? In the Lord's hand. Do you know that because of this, do you know that because of this, this is why we have so much adultery and fornication? This is why we have so many divorces and breakups right now because what I'm talking about is not understood. Did you know that? I'll bring it to a close in Colossians 2. What book did I say? Colossians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2. This is the reason why there's so much divorce and breakups because we simply do not understand this. The wise men said that a man that commits adultery doesn't understand. He simply doesn't understand what we're talking about right now. And this is what he doesn't understand in the book of Colossians chapter 2 as we seek to bring this message to a close. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verses 10, speaking of Jesus, the Bible says, and ye are what? Complete where? In him. Which is the head of all principality and power. This is the key to the whole thing right here. You are complete where? Who is the him? In Jesus. You are complete in Jesus. Which means that without Jesus we are incomplete. And incomplete simply means you're missing something. In other words, without Jesus, you're missing something and too many men and women try to fill that void with a boyfriend or a girlfriend with a husband or a wife, and they get into a relationship or a marriage, and they believe that the husband or the wife, the boyfriend or girlfriend, are going to fill that emptiness and void, and when they get in a relationship, they still feel unsatisfied. And they say, maybe this one that I chose isn't the right one. Maybe there's another one out there. They're not satisfied. There's still a longing in their heart. And so they go and search for someone else and it leads to fornication and adultery and all debasing sins. And the problem was not the man or the woman. The problem was you can never be complete in man. You are only complete in him, in Jesus. And until you find Jesus, no relationship will be satisfied. No man, no woman can feel the emptiness of the heart. It is only filled by Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I believe that's sweet. You know, in heaven, I used to hear that there will be no marriage and given in marriage. And I thought to myself, here a man has worked all his life to find the right woman. And let's say he finds her and it's heaven on earth. I'm telling you, when I go home, it's heaven on earth. And I used to think, you moments would think in your mind, but Lord, I got to give that up. Because in heaven, there's no marriage. And given in marriage, they're going to be like the angels. But the Lord showed me this wonderful principle. You see, brothers and sisters, I hope that we're all aware of why God has given us human relationships. Do you know why? You know, God didn't have to make us husband and wife, brother and sisters, father and son. You know, God didn't have to make those relationships. You know why he did this? In the book Steps to Christ, we find the answer. It says that through the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, Jesus has sought to reveal himself to us. As a father pitieth his children, so our Father, heaven, pities us. As a mother comforts her child, so God wants to comfort us. As our elder brother 
as a son, as a husband to the church. All of these relationships are to reveal to us Jesus so that we may know him. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is what? Done away with. In other words, these relationships are partially seeking to reveal Jesus. But when these relationships like schoolmasters have brought us into an experience where we know Jesus, that which is in part is done away with. Because that true experience we've made, and we don't lose anything. We gain something better. What do you say? I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I want Jesus. And if we will follow God's plan, we can have it. What do you say? First thing, young men, where do you seek if you're seeking for a relationship? You're seeking the Lord, is that right? Young women, where, where are you, you going to put yourself? Are you going to put yourself in the attention, attract the attention of the man? Or are you going to put yourself in the hands of the Lord? And if we'll do that, First, seeking Jesus, we can become complete in him. What do you say? If this is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me as we, as we pray? Oh, Father, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that you have shown us clearly that we're living in the last days. And one of the greatest signs is the condition of men and women that are intent upon following their own ideas as it comes to relationships instead of following the will of God. But Lord, tonight, we don't want to simply follow our own choosing. Tonight, Lord, we want to surrender our will and our way our ideas and we want to come to the testimony of Jesus we want to come to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to find your program that we can have heaven on earth where we've made mistakes forgive us and Lord help us to start again afresh tonight that each one of us might seek the Lord that we might become complete in Jesus that we might be prepared for heaven for we have received heaven right here in our hearts and so as we continue further, we pray that you will seal these truths in our hearts and that we might be ready to meet you when you shall come. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Be with every kneeling soul. And may we rightly interpret what we have studied. In Jesus' name, amen. together amen? amen you know it's precious to be in with na in nature with God um, and ministry of healing in desire of ages we're told that Jesus often the early morning found him singing and in meditation and in prayer and those who are going to be ready to meet Jesus are going to be just like Jesus aren't they the early morning needs to find us that same way. Every morning, the intention of Christ, when the sun rose up in the morning, it was to be a test to see who would be ready for the coming of Jesus. 
You know, the Bible likens Jesus to a son, doesn't it? And Psalm just says, the Lord God is a sun and shield. Every morning when the sun rises in the east, we're told that the coming of Christ is going to come from the east. As the lightning cometh from the east to the west, so all shall so the coming of the Son of Man be. Every morning, if you are sleeping, instead of welcoming Jesus, you're not going to be ready for the coming of Jesus. God is trying to get us ready for his coming. Oftentimes, he would meet and give special instructions early in the morning, wouldn't he? Morning manners are some of the most precious times of any meetings. Whether we're in a meeting like this or any time, God has always given morning manners, isn't he? And anciently, when God wanted to teach the importance of morning manna to the children of Israel where they were traveling in the wilderness, every morning God would give them manna, wouldn't he? And when the manna would come, you remember that they were to feed off of that manna every morning. And I ask you a question. What did that manna represent? Two great things. Number one, Jesus said, you remember commenting, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In one sense, the manna represented the written word of Jesus. And every morning, God has a special revelation from the Bible, from the written word, to reveal to those who will be willing to receive it. But then in another sense, it represented not only this written word, but Jesus in John 6 said, I am the living bread that come up down from heaven. It represented not only the written word, but it represented the living word, the personal word, Jesus Christ. Every morning, God has a special experience in the Word of God. And he has a special experience with the person Jesus for every one of us. But let me let you in on a little secret. When the sun rose up, what happened to the manna? What does the Bible say? It did what? I don't hear you. Are you sleeping? It melted, didn't it? Now, there was water that came out of a rock later on that day or the other days. Many miracles God did in the daytime, but that manna was gone. And I praise God that there are blessings that we can receive all day long, every day. But there are special revelations from the word of God that you can only get in the morning. There are special experiences with Jesus, the person that we can only get early in the morning. And so the wise men said, they that seek me early shall find me. There's a special revelation that God wants to give us today. I want it, don't you? I want Jesus. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is about to come. We're living in the final generation. I was just reading the other day of what took place in Bangladesh. You heard about it. That massive cyclone and destruction, thousands of lives perished. And God is trying to tell us, probation's hours fast closing, and the majority of us, we're not ready. We don't know Jesus as we should. Let this weekend be a revival and reformation. What do you say? Amen. This morning, we're going to be studying on the subject, Thy will be done thy will be done. If you will reverently kneel with me. Our Father, we're so thankful that even in the most holy place that there is a mercy seat. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we can come to Thee and find help in time of need. 
And we know that one of the greatest, the greatest thing that the devil is doing to present souls from being prepared to meet thee is by involving us in relationships, either married or unmarried, that is not according to thy will. And so we ask that this morning that you will give us a special revelation in your word and with Jesus that will bring us to the place where in every experience of our lives we only want one thing, that thy will will be done. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with every waiting heart, those that are still on their way, and that you'll allow our minds to be focused and not distracted, that we might comprehend the deep things of God. Send your spirit now, we pray. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and abide with us, Lord. Give us a special sab of blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew, to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. How many of you brought your notebooks? Praise the Lord. Pen and paper? Praise the Lord. What were the three books yesterday that we said that we needed, along with our Bibles, to really understand the subject we're studying? Avenue's Home? Messages to Young People? Ministry of Healing. Everyone that is looking to follow God's will should study these pages earnestly on our knees that we might find out the will of God. Amen. Now, we know that in a setting like this, we can only have an introduction. There's no way we can exhaust such a tremendous thing. But I hope that this would introduce you in a way to these books and into these principles that it may guide you as we seek to prepare for eternity. Amen. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You see, brothers and sisters, we are on the verge of a great and stupendous crisis. We are on the verge right now of the crisis over the seal of God and over the mark of the beast. We have been told that in these last days, this world as we know it cannot continue much longer. Everything in our world is in agitation. We see it in the political world. We see it in the environmental world. We see it in the social and the economical world. This world cannot continue much longer. Probation's hour is fast closing. And the majority of us, we don't understand that Satan as a roaring lion is seeking how he may devour us. And God is trying to get us ready in these last days and far more than we do today. We must study the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. For they have more significance to us in these last days than they do in any other generation. In fact, in Matthew 6, you'll notice what the Bible says. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus is giving his great sermon on the mount. And in this sermon, he gives what has been termed the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer, brothers and sisters, is a model prayer. Is that right? This model prayer that God gave carries in it a great deal more than what you and I could ever imagine is in this prayer. In this prayer, Jesus has given us the secret of life. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 6, beginning in verses 9. Would you read it with me? Matthew 6, beginning in verses 8. Let's read that together. It says in verses 9, rather, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, how? In earth, how? As it is in heaven. And that's enough for now. Jesus in this prayer has taught us the secret of life. He said that there is a way that you and I can have heaven right here on this earth. And he taught us to pray, thy will be done in earth, how? As it is in heaven. Now question, how is God's will done in heaven? Just a little of the will of God? Part of the will of God? Or the perfect will of God? Those angels, all they're doing are hearkening unto the commandments of God, unto the words of God. They're fulfilling the word of God. And if you and I were carry on that wheel that is taking place in heaven, down here on this earth, we can have heaven on earth. Is that right? The principles of heaven right here on this earth, you and I can have it provided that we do the will of God. Now, brothers and sisters. This wheel, if we will do it, it is the secret to every experience in life. Whether it's in diet or in dress, whether it's in education or association, whether it's in recreation, whether it's in our music or in the way we use our time and money, all we should be seeking to do is one thing. That is to please the Lord according to the will of God. And if we could learn that lesson to live according to the will of God, we could have the experience, as Paul said, of being in heavenly places. Now, brothers and sisters, when we think about that will and we apply it to the experience of courtship and marriage, we must understand that this is even the great lesson that Jesus sealed his experience with while he was on this earth. You remember that when Jesus was in the shadow of the cross in Gethsemane, thrice he prayed a prayer. And what did he pray? Not my will, but thine. Thine what? Thine. thine will be done. And when you and I learn that lesson as Jesus learned it, it sealed his experience as he was getting ready to go to the cross when he was in that shadow. He prayed, not my will, but thine. Thy will be done. And those who are prepared for the loud cry in the latter rain, those who are prepared for the time of trouble and the seal of God, we read in early writings, page 71, that those who are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. We must come to the experience where in every experience of our life, all we want is just one thing. And what is that? That God's will be done in our lives. Now when we take that and apply it, as I said, to courtship and marriage, that means that the will of God, we are not seeking simply what we want, but we are seeking what God wants. Now how does God reveal his will to us? Is he going to send an angel from heaven and speak with an audible voice and say, now this is my will. How does God reveal his will to us? Through his word. That's one great way, isn't it? Turn to Jeremiah. What book did I say? Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 10. In fact, before we get there, go to Matthew 7. Then we'll come right back to Jeremiah chapter 10. And I think that very, at the very beginning of our session this morning, we need to come face to face with a great reality. That if the program that I'm giving you today is God's program, do you think that it's going to be like the programs of this world when we deal with courtship and marriage? God forbid is right. I mean, think about it. If we follow the ways of the world and the principles of the world, we can only get the same results that the world gets. Is that right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not impressed with the world's results. You know that worldly statistics, they say that the marriages of today, that over 50% of them end up in divorce. And that's not talking about the ones that are still unhappy in marriage. That's simply the ones that end in the divorce court. But there are multitudes that are separated, multitudes that they are legally married, but practically they're divorced. You can live in the same house and be separated from your wife. 
And that happens long before marriage is entered into. It is in the principles of courtship where these lessons are learned and experienced. And this is why we must understand not our will, but God's will in these principles. Are you with me? And brothers and sisters, heaven's statistics is worse than man's statistics. You know what heaven says? Volume 4, the testimonies. You should be writing this down. 503, 504. It says that there is not one marriage in a hundred that had resulted happily. Do you believe the testimonies? It says there is not how many? One marriage in 100. From the one who knows, volume 4, Testimonies for the Church, page 503, 504. Now tell me, what is the percentage of that? Less than one. It says there is not one in a hundred, not one in a hundred, which means it's less than one percent. That means that 99 percent of the marriages, when this was written, 99 percent was marriages that were unhappy. Now, do you think it got any better today? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse. We are worse today than we were a hundred years ago. We are even less now. That means that over 99% of the marriages today are unhappy marriages. And that's the one who knows. So if we follow the plan that the world is following, that means if we want happiness, how much of the percent are we going to be following? What type of program? That means that 90, uh, over 99% are not going to be doing what we need to be doing to have happiness. Are you with me? Then the plan that I give you if it's the right plan, if it is a divinely inspired plan, if it's God's plan, will the great majority of the world be following it? Then if you want happiness, you got to be willing to be peculiar and different, don't you? And the reason is this, not that Jesus is simply trying to make us different in the way we carry on courtship and, and, and marriage, but the reality is this, if we're doing what the world is doing, we are going to get the results that the world is getting. Do you see? That's just logical, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but I want happiness. Happy is the home that knows the plan of God. In fact, the Bible says the same thing in Matthew 7. What book did I say? Matthew 7, the Bible, in that same Sermon on the Mount, after he shared the thoughts of the Mount of Blessings and the secret to the principles of life, he said in Matthew 7, notice, notice this, verse 13 it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth where? To destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is what? The way that which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now you tell me, which one of the percentages of those who have happiness or, or of the married couples are in the broad road? Which one of those percentages, the 99 or the 1? They're on the road that's leading to destruction and death, is that right? And the 1% is on that road that is leading to life, the less than 1%. And I want to be on that road, which means that the majority of this world are going to be carrying on their courtship and their marriage in a way that guess who is running those courtships? Do you believe that? I'll read it to you. Messages to young people. I guess you didn't know that Satan has his love connection. Did you know that? Messages to young people. Listen to what the prophet says. Messages to Young People, page 450. We read this. Courtship as carried on in this age is a scheme of deception. A what? A scheme of deception in hypocrisy with which the enemy of souls has far more to do than, than the Lord. So who is behind most of the courtships of this world? The devil. Now, do you want the devil courting you? It says, good common sense. What? 
Good common sense is needed here, if anywhere, but the fact is, it has little to do in the matter. And then it goes on to say that there are men that are professed Christians, that they are sensible on every other subject. They can explain the truths that relate to the last days. They understand the work of the present hour, yet they don't understand this idea of courtship and marriage. And that is the only door that Satan needs to get in and neutralize the whole effect of the gospel. We heard it yesterday from the evangelist who spoke it so eloquently when he said that one sin cherished can eventually neutralize the whole gospel. Well, this is the greatest one is Satan can get us into a relationship that has not been ordained by God. He can exercise his skill here than in any other direction. We read about what he did with Samson, one of the strongest physically, didn't we? With Solomon, who was one of the strongest mentally, and with David, who was one of the strongest spiritually. And it was just this one thing, this idea of the relationships. And so if you and I don't understand this, we are leading down a road that will end in destruction and death. And I'm not making this up. You can read Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7, and it says that these relationships lead to hell. Exact words. It's just that serious. What do you say? But if you and I will come back into the mountain with Jesus... If we will behold God's ideal for us, we can have heaven instead of hell. We can have happiness instead of sorrow. We can have joy. And our homes could be a foretaste of heaven right here on this earth. But provided that we follow a plan that is totally peculiar. So now listen to me. As we begin to start studying, we're going to start this morning, then we're going to go this evening and continue, and then we're going to finish tomorrow. But I want you to see this. Don't expect me to give you a program and relationships and courtship and marriage, what the world is doing. If you want that program, then you can see someone else. Amen? Amen. But the program that I'm going to give you is one that is not based on my ideas, not one that is based on the opinions of man or Hollywood. You see, most people get the ideas of courtship and marriage and love and romance from watching the movie screens. They learn their lines, young people and adults, learn their lines from the movies. And repeat the same words, go through the same idea and schemes of deception and hypocrisy. And as a result, they get the results that those Hollywood actors are getting. Nothing but unhappiness. And so I'm not going to use any of that in these classes. What we're going to be studying is the great foundational sources. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now somebody says, well, you're narrow-minded. Yes. Yes. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. My mind is only narrow enough to believe in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Anything more than that, we open up the door for the devil to bring in deception of almost every kind while we believe that we're following the will of God. We only want one thing, and what is that? The will of God. Where is the will of God revealed? The prophets reveal the will of God. You remember that the, the, the scriptures came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, they spoke as they were moved out. So these prophets, they were not giving the words of themselves or the words of man. These prophets were giving what? The words of God and the will of God. Now, now I wonder, do we have a prophet in these last days? Oh, that wonderful messenger of the remnant. In these latter days, God is still revealing his will, and he has never revealed it as clearly as he is revealing it today in both the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. And those that are going to be ready for the coming of Jesus, not only are they keeping the commandments of God, they have something else. What do they have? The testimony of Jesus. And what is that? That's the spirit of prophecy. Do you have it? I did not say, is it on your shelf? These books on our shelves will never make happy homes. Adventist home, messages to young people, ministry of healing in the Bible, we must take them off of the shelves and through the Holy Spirit, allow them to be brought into our hearts and live down in our lives, and the result is happiness. For if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Are you with me? So don't expect me to give you a plan that the world is following. We're going to follow here in this class the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah. What book did I say? Now my time is getting away from me. I've got to move on. Amen. Hasten on. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah the 10th chapter. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 
Now, brothers and sisters, we must understand that when we deal with this idea of relationships that are leading to heaven, God has given us stair steps to heaven, almost like Jacob's ladder. Every run or round goes higher and higher, and God has given us steps to reach into the experiences in our relationship that reach heaven. He has given us steps, principles that lead to heaven. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah the 10th chapter, beginning in verses 23, let's read that together. Jeremiah 10, beginning in verse 23, what does the Bible say? It says, O Lord, I know what? That the way of man is not where? It's not in himself. Now watch the point. It is not in man that walketh to do what? To direct his steps. So the Bible says that the man of God, that God is going to be directing his what? His steps. Now can man direct his own steps? It is not in man. Now man can direct it, but where will his own steps lead him? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of destruction and death. And so, brothers and sisters, when we look at, at the steps that we're on, that the steps that we're walking, we must make sure that the steps of a good man are ordered how? After the Lord. Psalms 119 says, Psalms 119 says, go to Psalms 119, then we'll come back. Psalms 119, what book did I say? Psalms, the 119th division. And notice what the Bible says in Psalms, the 119th division. We are following that God's plan, he gives us steps. Are you with me? I want to read something to you. You're going to Psalms 119, but I want to read something to you about these steps. I'm in the book, Avin is Home, page 49. Avin is Home, page 49. Notice what the prophet says in Avin is Home, page 49. It says, let every step, how many? Let every step Toward a marriage alliance, be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife, both in this world and in the world to come. A sincere Christian. Hey, what type of Christian? And there are some Christians that they have a name that they live, but they're dead. A sincere Christian. That's a true Christian. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. Now, I want you to see something specific here. Now, watch now. Watch now. Listen. It says, let every step toward a marriage alliance, which tells us that if we're looking in God's plan to enter into a marriage alliance, then there's going to be what? Steps. Let every step. Now, if there was only one step, would inspiration say let every step? What would I say if there's only one step? Let the step of marriage. Is that right? But the fact that inspiration says let every step shows that as we are looking to move toward the marriage alliance, there's more than one step. Are you with me? Let every step toward the marriage alliance. Now, the reason why this is important, because remember, the steps of a good man are ordered after the Lord. And it's not in man to direct his steps. You can't direct your steps as it leads to marriage. We must have God directing us in these steps. Now, brothers and sisters, most people, they only look as if there's only one or two steps. But I want you to see that if we are following and studying the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that there are at least seven steps. How many? And I want us to look at that. Go in your Bible to Proverbs. What book did I say? Well, let's read this first and then we'll go right to Proverbs. Psalms 119. We'll read it there. Psalms 119, the Bible says, and 134, Psalms 119, 134, let's read that together. The Bible says, 133, Psalms 119, 133, it says, order my steps, where? In thy word, and let not iniquity have, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. So these steps should be ordered after what? After the word. Both in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we have the words of Jesus. Now, in Proverbs 9, I have suggested that there are at least seven steps. Now, when you study through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, you might want to add more steps 
or you might want to use less steps. But for the sake of our study, you'll see why I chose seven. Proverbs chapter 9. What book did I say? Proverbs chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Proverbs chapter 9, beginning in verses 1. Let's read it together. Proverbs 9, beginning in verses 1. The Bible says, Wisdom have what? Have built in her house. She have hewn out what? Seven pillars. So this house that wisdom has built it, how many pillars that this wisdom build? Seven. Now these pillars are nothing more than principles in which a house is built upon. They are pillars. Pillars support a house. They support it. And the Bible says that this wisdom has hewn out how many pillars? Seven. These are seven principles which I have likened as inspiration does as seven steps that lead to an experience in marriage that is of heaven and not of this earth. And the problem is that the majority of people, they don't climb up these steps. You know that? The majority of people, they just run out and they have an urge. They want to be with somebody. And so they just run into, if anything, they'll run into courtship and into marriage. And they do what the world calls falling in love. You ever heard that? Now, where do you find that in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? In God's plan, you don't fall in love. In God's plan, you step into that experience. Might I remind you of a law of physics? You don't fall up. You can only fall down. And the people that fall in love, they end up very soon falling out of love. Into divorce and separation and all the rest. And even those who don't leave, they have an experience not like heaven, but like hell. Right here on this earth. Those who enter into the experience of love, they don't fall into it. They step into the experience. They climb Jacob's ladder because every round goes what? Higher and higher. They follow these steps. And if you don't know these steps, and I can tell you, you're not yet in that experience. You can be. Because that you cannot direct your steps. You can only find it in the word and in the testimonies of his spirit. What do you say? Now I want to know what these steps are. What do you say? You want to know these steps? Now the last step, I believe that every one of us can know what that is. What is the final step? What is the final step that we're moving toward? What is the goal of it all when God is leading two people together? Marriage. Is that right? My board is small. I normally would like a big board I can just write on. But we'll use this and we say it's marriage. So I just put M-A-R. We know what that means. The seventh step is the final step which leads and ends in what? In marriage. Now what is the step before marriage? Before marriage? No. Before marriage, engagement. Is that right? Now, what comes before engagement? Courtship. Thank you. And so the seventh step is what? Marriage. The sixth step is what? Engagement. The fifth step is what? But now, brothers and sisters, most people, when they think about stepping into this experience, moving toward this alliance, they run straight from an urge to want to be with somebody. And if they even understand something about God's plan, they rush into courtship, don't they? They see somebody in the church or somebody they're interested in, and they say, well, now she looks nice. She looks spiritual. He looks nice. He looks spiritual. I think we need to begin courting. But on our diagram, we have four steps prior to even courtship has ever entered into and most people have no idea what these four steps are. You see, the world, they skip these four steps. And they slide into what they call courtship and dating. And as a result, as we said, by sliding through these steps, they fall into love. And so we need to study what those four steps are. But that's not our study today. Uh, we'll come back to that. But my point is, I want to bring this in right here. What is courtship anyway? What is courtship? I'm taking a hand from the congregation. Let me see how much time I have because I want to build a case. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. What is courtship? I see a hand. Learning one another. All right. Someone else. What is courtship? You don't have to be afraid. We're in the class. Amen. 
is preparing for marriage. All right. Sharing lifestyles. All right. Anyone else before we go on? Becoming, becoming friends. Now, all these things have a part into it. But I want to give you something. You're taking notes. I want you to write this down. Courtship is a sincere and earnest effort of two that are seeking to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. Courtship is the sincere effort of two to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. What is courtship? Would you say it with me? A sincere effort of two to find out if it's God's will for them to be married. Now, this is totally different from dating. You see, in dating, many people think that you date this person, this person, this person, that person, this person, and they tell you, many adults sometimes will even tell you, that this gives you a broad-mindedness so that you understand and are qualified to better make a proper decision. You won't find anything remotely like that in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. That has originated from the apostate. You see, brothers and sisters, the way that we're to find out what God's will is, is not by dating this one and that one and that one. Tell me, do you know what's in that person even when you date them? A man's heart is deceitful above all things. You don't even know your own heart. And you want to know the heart of somebody else? No. You can't understand this by yourself. It is only in God to direct our steps. But multitudes believe that they have a broad-mindedness, and as a result, they go about dating this person and that one, and they set themselves up for failure. You know why? You see, a the marriage altar. He has to make a promise before God and holy angels when he stands at that altar. And he has to say, in his own way, he has to promise that he is going to forsake all others and give himself to that one woman, his wife, as long as they both shall live. And the, I mean, the man will say, will you do this? The pastor, the preacher at the appropriate time will say, will you keep yourself from all others? And that man has to say what? I do. I do. He's promising. Now, if he would really be honest, following the world plan, he could not say, I do. Do you know what he had to say at the altar? And that marriage altar, he would say, you know, preacher, I don't know if I can promise that. He would have to say, because I have never done it in my life. I've gone out with whoever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I've never restrained myself. I've let my hands fondle whoever I wanted to fondle. I've let my words of love and affection go out to this girl and that girl and this girl and that girl talking to this one and then that one. He says, I have never have kept myself only into one because in my dating program, I've dated whoever I wanted to and as many as I wanted to. And as a result, how can he promise having never practiced it? But when you follow God's plan, long before that ever happened, you have been keeping yourself from this. But someone says, well, then how will you know who is the right person? Well, brothers and sisters, the same way we know anything. The one who knows will let us know if we follow his plan. And these first four steps are to help us understand who God's plan is. These are preliminary steps that are before courtship that help us to stop wasting time with people that we should never even court. You see, courtship is not like picking a car or a carpet and we're just having fun. Most people think, well, let's just go together and we'll go to a movie here, a club here, or this place here, or even to church. And we can just date around and have a good time. Dating young people and adults is not for a good time. Did you know that? Now, someone says, do you mean to tell me that Courtship should not be beautiful and solemn and joyful. No, it should be joyful. But that which makes it joyful is not playing around. The presence of Christ brings fullness of joy. Courtship is a very serious thing. And the reason why marriages are so unhappy and unholy today is because courtships are carried on in a spirit of flirtation, just like the marriages. And somebody says, well, the rest of the world, they're doing it this way. Well, I told you, 99% of the world, they don't have happy homes, do they? Because they follow this program that the world is following. But you and I, we don't want our will. We want the will of God. Are you with me? Now there are four preliminary steps. But even in these preliminary steps, my friend, these steps must be built on something. 
this building. Do I just lay this building down? What do I put on top of it? What do I have to put down before I can build a building on the ground? You have to lay a foundation. Every step, every staircase has to have a what? A foundation. And even people that know something about what we're talking about here. These seven steps, even before we get to the seven steps, there must be a broad foundation in which these steps are built on. Are you with me? In fact, go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? To the book of Luke chapter 6, and notice what the Bible says. You know when we look around the world today, oh, how many broken homes we see. Oh, how many broken marriages and relationships and hearts, broken hearts, all because of just one thing. And you know what it is? The majority have never been built on a proper or broad foundation. And the one who knows told us this secret. In the book of Luke chapter 6, notice what the great builder, that great carpenter, not only in the physical plane, but in the spiritual experiences of our life, notice what the great architect of the universe says. Luke chapter 6, beginning and verses 48. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. The Bible says Jesus has given a parable. In Luke 6, verse 46, he says, And why call ye me what? Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I... He said, why do you call me Lord, and yet you won't even do what I tell you to do? Then he gives two examples of two different men that built their houses differently. And in verses 49, he says, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a what? Foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it did what? It fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The reason why so many houses have been ruined today is because they have not built it on a proper foundation. So even with these seven steps, it must be placed or built on a proper foundation. Now let's see what happened to the man who built on a proper foundation. What happened to him? What happened to him? Verse 48 says, He is like a man which built a house, and diggeth deep, and laid a what? foundation on a rock and when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it for it was founded how upon a rock so a foundation was built and unless we build that foundation and you and I need to understand and that is what we're going to close on today what is this true foundation this broad foundation to the Christian home that these seven steps are built upon that we can lead into a marriage alliance and to a relationship that will prepare us for eternity for the kingdom of God and yea for translation itself oh I want heaven on earth what do you say but now let's see what it is and brothers and sisters, it says that the man who wants to build this house, he had to dig how? Now, there was a man that was telling me of an experience that happened in one of the great cities of our United States of America. He was in one of the great cities, and he was watching a crew build a great skyscraper. You know how high these skyscrapers get, don't you? Skyscrapers touch almost as it were the very sky. And as he was watching this, this man that was watching was unacquainted with the way that they build skyscrapers. So he was very amazed because before they built it, there was an excavation crew that was given the charge of digging. And when that man started watching this, he started looking and he noticed that they dug so deep into the ground, the man could not believe himself. And he asked the man that was in charge of this digging crew, he said, why do you dig so deep? You know the answer of the man? Because we're going up so high. <laughs> the higher that you must go, the deeper the foundation must be laid to support that which is resting upon it. Are you with me? So when we deal with the institution of the home, the institution of marriage, this is the greatest institution that God has ever created. Did you know that? Somebody says, well, what about the Sabbath? The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for this purpose, to bring us to this experience. This is the greatest institution, and they go hand in hand. They cannot be separated or dissolved, brothers and sisters. Now, this is the case here. Do you know, and we're going to study, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to say something strange to you. But you believe the Bible is spirit prophecy, won't you? Do you know 
that in order to really build a successful marriage, it takes nearly 20 years. Did you hear what I said? Nearly 20 years to build a proper foundation for the marriage relation. Did you know that? Somebody said, that's strange, Pastor. Why does it take so long? Well, tell me, if I'm building a skyscraper that is hundreds of feet tall, will I finish it in a week? Two weeks. The bigger I build, the longer it and the reason why we have so many unhappy homes and so many homes that are so close to earth is because they rush into marriage. They don't give God enough time to lay the foundation so that when the storms of practical life burst upon them, their houses fall. Do you see? If you want your marriage to enter into heaven, the higher you build, the deeper the foundation, the broader it must be laid. And let me tell you this, sometimes it may take over 20 or 30 or 40 years because just the experience of years doesn't mean you have the foundation. You know that, right? Now, are, is, is there any woman in here that know how to cook? Praise the Lord. That, uh, I hope the rest of you know how. We'll get there. But the point is, if you're going to cook some bread, what temperature do you think you put the bread on? What, what, give me a temperature. You're, those of you who know about cooking, what, what temperature? 350? Is that, we'll take 350. How long, averagely, would you put the bread in for 350? Average time. 25, 30 minutes, hour? Somebody says 25, 30 minutes to an hour. Now tell me something. If I turn the temperature down to 10 degrees, would 30 minutes be long enough? Would it take longer? And I'll tell you this. In most homes that children are growing up in today, from infancy to adolescence to childhood, the temperature has never been turned up to build this foundation. And as a result, sometimes it might even take longer because we're not looking just at time. We are looking for an experience. I remember when my wife was teaching me how to cook. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we're in marriage classes. And I remember when I was learning about baking these things, she would have me stick something in there to test to see if it was ready. Now, I know the average time, but when you put something into it and you test to see if it's ready or if it's prepared, it doesn't matter if 20 minutes pass by. If it's not ready, you can't take it out unless you want bread that's what? Half-baked. And the majority of marriages today are half-baked. Did you know that? Over 99% of marriages in this room and all over the world, have, most people have never been married at the right time. Did you know that? Even if it's the right person, most people have never been married at the right time. And as a result, instead of heaven, it's something far less than that. I mean, think about it. I love fruits, mangoes. And here in California, you know about the persimmons, don't you? Oh, I love those persimmons. Amen. But now I ask you, what happens if I take a persimmon before it's ripe? What will it do to my mouth? That same persimmon? Yes. Why? Because everything is only beautiful in its time. And the majority of people today, they're in such a rush, in such a hurry to get into a relationship that they rush through the experience and they enter unprepared and as a result the sweet of the, the fruit of marriage which should be sweet is sour and bitter every fruit is that way don't you know that you can take the sweetest fruit in the world but if you get it before it's ripe and ready or it's going to be bitter and that's what's taking place today and what we mean by being ready is that this foundation must be laid. Are you with me? And so you may be 60 or 16. Unless this foundation is laid, you're not ready for marriage. Did you know that? You can be 80 years old and not ready for marriage. Because this foundation of heaven never been laid. Some people will never be ready for marriage. Do you know why Jesus is not here today? Do you know why? We are not ripe. We, the church, his marriage, he knows he has the right woman, the church, but she's not ready. And Jesus loves us enough to. Heavenly Father, in such a sacred room and sacred service, help us not to be distracted, dear God.
In Jesus' name, amen. And so, brothers and sisters, it's very important that we understand this principle of preparation. Are you with me? We need this foundation, this broad foundation to be laid. And while the foundation is great, it's very simple. Do you know what the foundation is built on two things? This foundation is built on two things, and we'll use this to bring it to a close. It's built on two great principles, this, this preparation that we need. Number one is built on love and self-control. What did I say? Love and self-control. And I would have us to think of it in three ways. Love and self-control. This is the foundation. And if we haven't learned it, whether we're 6, 16, or 60, we need to learn these principles because until we learn this, we're not ready for marriage. And you'll see why. It's just common sense. We'll see in a moment as we study. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Now, when we think about love and self-control, these are not things that are not acquainted with each other. They are related. It's like a coin. Every coin has how many sides? Two sides. Every coin has two sides. And the two sides of this experience of preparation or foundation is love on one side and self-control. And I want you to think about it like this. In a car, how many pedals are there? How many? Two pedals. Well, if you get driving a stick, that means that you, you're operating yourself, aren't you? We're talking about an automatic. Amen. An automatic two pedals. The two pedals is what? The grass and the brake. Now, I want you to think of love as the power to go. Love as the power to go, the gas. Love as the power to what? And self-control as the power to stop, to slow down or to stop. Now, I don't know about you, but a good driver, he has to learn how to balance those two pedals, doesn't he? He has to learn how to go when it's time to go, and he has to learn how to slow down and stop when it's time to stop. And this tells me, that this is the same way in this experience of courtship and marriage, we must learn love and self-control. Now tell me, would you want to drive in a car with a, a car that only has a gas? <laughs> if it only has gas, I'm not driving with you. What if it only has a brake? You can't go anywhere. And most homes, either they're going so fast that they get into ruin, or they never go anywhere. We must learn love and self-control. And God intended that we learn this. Guess where God intended that we learn this? You know what the oven is that bakes this bread that prepares for wholesome marriage? You know what the oven is? I'm reading the messages to young people. The very last uh, page in this entire book, this wonderful volume, 466. Listen to what it says. It is by faithfulness to duty in the parental home that youth are to prepare themselves for homes of their own. Messages, young people, 466. It is by faithfulness to duty where? In the parental home that youth are to prepare themselves for homes of their own. So where are we to learn these lessons? God intended that we learn this in the home, but most people haven't learned it. In fact, we'll look at it this way. This is the oven. Now, I would have us think of love in three ways. Number one, I would have us think of love as manifested in obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments, obey. So the first principle is love is manifested in obedience. Number two, love is manifested in in service. Now, a question might be asked, what is the difference between obedience and what? And service. Obedience is, being, is doing what you've been told to do. Service is doing what needs to be done even if you haven't been asked to do it. You see, wonderful is that home that has children and young people and even adults that will simply look and see what needs to be done. There's the dishes. Mother didn't ask me to do it. Father didn't ask me to do it. But the dishes need to be done, so I'm going to do it. Are you with me? House needs to be clean. No one asked me to do it, but, but, but I'm just going to do it. 
Obedience is doing what parents have told you to do. Service is doing what needs to be done, even if you've never been asked. And a young person may not know it, or, but when a young woman or a young girl learns to obey, when they learn to do what they've been asked, told to do, and when they learn to look around the home that to see what needs to be done, even when they're not taught to be, they are learning to be good husbands and good wives. Did you know that? Most people today say, if you don't tell me to do it, I'm not going to do it. You're not ready for marriage. You're not ready for marriage. And the last one is bearing responsibility. And this is very important. You see, brothers and sisters, it's a very serious thing to carry on a family, isn't it? I mean, think about the man. He has to be able to provide financially for his family. He has to be able to provide socially for his family. He has to be able to lead his family into an spiritual experience. It is a great responsibility. And the same with a woman. Isn't it a great responsibility to keep the home running as it should be run? And let me tell you this. The young girl that sleeps when her mother is making breakfast is preparing to let her husband get the breakfast that she should have prepared. And the young man that sees grass that needs to be cut, that sees work in the house that needs to be done, that sees the Stramley family struggling for money and does not work to support it, is simply preparing to let his wife suffer. Do you see? It is by faithfulness to the duty and the parental home that we are prepared, that we are baked, that the foundation is being laid for us to carry on homes of our own. Do you see the point? And unless we can learn these lessons of obedience, service, and responsibility, and I'll tell you this, young ladies, it takes more than learning how to bake cookies to keep a home running. It's one thing to bake cookies, but we can't eat cookies every day, all day long. It's a responsibility to be able to learn how to cook meal after meal, day after day. But remember now, not all I have to obey or all is not being done, so I need to do it, but to do it happily. To do it cheerfully. And when a young man or a young woman learns this in the home, do you know that God is preparing them for a successful marriage? Most children don't learn this today. Did you know that? Most adults don't even learn this today. You see, most of us think of love as selfishness. And I'm going to say this as we get ready to bring a, some closing points on this point of self-control. Someone was telling me of a cartoon article that was shown. A cartoonist in the Saturday Evening Post pictured a couple that was getting ready to get married. They were standing at the marriage altar, and they were both envisioning what the married life was all about. And as they were envisioning this married life, you know what the man was thinking? The man was sitting there in his vision, in his little corner. He was thinking of his wife bringing him breakfast in bed <laughs> on a silver tray with the paper, with all the foods that he liked. And he's just sitting there with his little, all his necessities right there on that little tray and that platter. And the woman on her corner, she was daydreaming too. <laughs> you know what her daydream was? She saw that she was getting breakfast in bed. And on her tray was roses and the food that she liked and the different things that she wanted. Now, while we might smile at that, do you know that's really what most people think of the marriage relation? They think of it as what they can get out of it. Husband thinking, I can enter in this because now I don't have to cook anymore. I don't have to be aware about this. I can enter into this union. This is what in the mind, selfishly, and the wife the same way. We have never been trained to think unselfishly, but if we would learn obedience and service and bearing responsibility, we would come to the point where cheerfully and happily we would be thinking not of pleasing ourselves, but of pleasing what? And until we learn that, we're not ready for marriage. I don't care how old we are. And then finally, self-control. And I'll look at three aspects of this. Control on the area of appetite. What did I say? Affection. And the passions. In the early life, 
appetite, we must learn self-control in the appetite and the affections, affections and the passions. Now, when we say appetite, what are we talking about? Food, eating and drinking, is that right? You know that a child that is not taught to properly eat and drink at the right time, when they eat any time they want, whatever they want, ice cream and cake and all the things that, that are not healthy for our bodies, when they give in to the urges of their stomach, do you know, brothers and sisters, when they don't practice self-control, do you know that they are preparing to move into the area of the passions and not be able to control that? Did you know that? You see, the appetites and the passions are closely connected. And when a young person is not trained in infancy and childhood and adolescence to control their appetite, they are unprepared when they come to the teenage years to control the impulse that are running them to get into a connection with girlfriend and boyfriend and touching each other and kissing each other and finally lending, lead, leading to the full breaking of the seventh commandment and fornication and adultery. They are not prepared to do it because they are not Strong enough, they have never built the muscle of self control. Did you know that? We look at people and we say, How in the world could they fall to fornication and adultery? How could they do it? They look like they were spiritual in every other way, but because they had never been practicing control here on the appetite. And you know, most of us have been trained to be indulgent from our infancy. You know how? When we give the baby, milk to drink at any time we want. Anytime, every time they cry, we just put a bottle in their mouths. You know what it does? It trains them in a habit of eating what they want, when they want, and as they grow. You know the inspiration and child guidance tells us that we should have regularity with our children and with the babies for this very reason. Did you know that? God is getting us ready. Appetite and affections. What about the affections? That's who we are to love. You know who are teenagers to love? Boyfriend and girlfriend, you know that up in the teenage years, the people that we're to learn, where do we learn how to love husband and wife? Somebody says, it's in dating, going to this person and that person. We learn it in the parental home. By learning to love father and mother, brother and sister, auntie and uncle, by learning to love them, and most children get into what is called puppy love. You know what puppy love is? That's you, that is what you call uh, young love, long, young loving when you're too young. Most people do this. You know why? And I'm coming to a close. But most people do this. You know why? Those of you who know health, if a person does not eat the right amount of fruits, what do they crave? Sugar. And they interpret that craving as needing sugar and sweets when what they really need is what? More fruits. Most people don't eat the proper amount of fruits, fresh fruits. If you had enough fruit, you wouldn't even crave so much the sweets of candy and all the rest. It shows us, my brothers and my sisters, that we're lacking something. And the reason why most young people want a boyfriend and girlfriend so young is because they're craving for love in their own homes. You know how many young girls have been turned out by men because their fathers won't show them love and affection. Won't put their arms around them and hug them and kiss them and talk to them and have friendship with them, learning who you should love. Brother and sister are fighting with each other. And when a brother fights with his sister or mother and neglects them, you know, that man, that boy is preparing to fight with his wife. When a man neglects his mother. He's just preparing to neglect his wife. Did you know that? And when a woman does not show respect for her brother, when a woman does not show respect for her father, she's just preparing to disrespect her own husband and prepare a home that can never lead to heavenly places. Where do we learn this? In the parental home. This is the foundation, and I tell you, I don't care how beautiful your home is, that unless you have years of this type of training, you're not ready. Do you know that in courtship, it takes a tremendous amount of self-control? Did you know that? For a man and a woman who are attracted to each other spiritually and physically, for them to be with each other and in company with each other, 
and yet guard his eyes so that they're not sending love messages. Or guard his hands so he's not touching her where he should not be touching her. Or not embracing her as a lover embraces. Or not kissing her and all the rest that leads to the breaking of the fifth, seventh commandment. I tell you, in order to control yourself to the point where you may think that possibly this might be my wife. And yet control yourself. I say it takes a tremendous amount of self-control. And if you have not learned this in the parental home for years, then your muscle is not strong enough. And that's why there's so much premarital sex. And adultery and fornication, because I tell you, on the marriage day when the vows are said, God does not as a special gift give self-control. Did you know that? Self-control is the result of entering to this experience much earlier with him. And if you haven't learned it, we need to learn it when? Now. This is the foundation. Let's get ready to bring it to a close in Luke 6 as we close today. You know, somebody says, but pastor, you're taking all the romance out of courtship. Oh, yes. A certain amount. You see, the time for romance and love should best be reserved for marriage. Did you know that? Inspiration said most of the courtship should be continued into the marriage. You see, the time for affection and the display of love is when every question has already been settled. The reason why there's so many broken hearts is because you get so emotionally attached. Do you know that hormones are sent in your body? Whenever a man touches a woman, God designed for hormones to be released in the body, and it arouses that young man, that young woman, thoughts, minds, actions. And brothers and sisters, when that happens, it begins to bring about emotional ties and so some people are so emotionally tied before they even know if it's God's one for them so even if they get counsel it's just a form they're not really listening they say oh we're going to get married I don't care what you say we're going to get married then what do you need God for do you see and so brothers and sisters the time for romance is when every question has been settled and you know, by the grace of God, this is the one. And that is that marriage and only even the words of love that we use sometimes. You know, in heaven, the Bible says we're going to get a new name. Is that right? Yeah. But it's not until we get to heaven. Some couples exchange love names. Baby. You're the one and only. How many girls have heard that only to find that they weren't the one and only? Those words, just as Jesus reserves them unto those who are going to be saved, should be reserved until it's settled that we have the right one. Is that right? And all of it is built on one thing. Luke 6, as we close. 47 says, Whosoever cometh to me, Luke 6, 47, and hear of my sayings, and what? And do with them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged how? Deep. And laid the foundation where? On a rock. Here's that steps, here's the foundation, and it's laid where? Who was the rock? That rock was Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 4. This is why. The experience with Jesus is the foundation of it all. Amen. And every young woman and every young man that wants only one thing. Not my will. Not this way, that way. Not my will, but thy will be done. Someone says this is hard. Oh yes, it's a hard saying. But straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that lead to life. And few there be that find. If you're not willing to follow these steps, then all you're doing is inviting the devil to bring you to hell. I want happiness. What do you say? If this is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me?
Oh, Father, we're so thankful that the Bible is clear and that the spirit of prophecy does not lead us to direct our own steps, but that the steps of a good man are ordered after thee. They're ordered by your word and both the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. But every step must be built upon a great foundation of love and self-control. Lord, we just ask that all of this may be built upon a foundation, as we learned last night, of a relationship with thee. Because until a young man is placed in the hands of the Lord, and until a young woman is placed in the hands of the Lord, on that rock, they can't even build a foundation. And so help us just now, that while our desires may be saying, well, Lord, I want this, I want that, I want this, and I want that, that we may learn to control it even now by saying, Lord, not my will. Not what I think, but thy will be done. And if we'll learn this, Lord, you promised that we can have heaven on earth. Help every kneeling soul, every young person, every adult, that we may learn these lessons that we might be prepared for eternity. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. What book did I say? To the book of Proverbs chapter 11. And we'll try to take these last few moments that we have to just give some practical insight, as we said, to this courtship and relationships. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 11, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In fact, let's go to Deuteronomy 11, then we'll go to Proverbs 11. Deuteronomy 11, we were talking about how we can have foretaste of heaven right here on this earth. And we're going to look in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and see one of the most interesting texts in all the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Deuteronomy 11, are you ready to study for a little while? Do you want to study this subject? Deuteronomy chapter 11, notice what the Bible says. And we're going to pick up in verses 19. Speaking of the words that were to be in the soul and that were to be taught to the children, the Bible says in verse 19, And ye shall do what? Teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou sittest in the house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou what? And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiply and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them how? As the days of what? As the days of heaven where? So the Bible says that we can have provided we follow God's instruction the days of heaven where? Right here on this earth. We can have heaven on this earth provided we follow God's plan. Are you with me? And so we found that Jesus taught his disciples to pray in that great Sermon on the Mount, in the model prayer, in the Lord's Prayer. He taught them to pray as we studied this morning, Thy will be done, how? On earth, how? As it is in heaven. And if we live the principles of heaven on this earth, we can have the days of heaven upon this earth, provided that we follow the principle. Now, we read a statement from volume four of the testimonies, page 503 and 504, that says that there is not one marriage in a hundred that has resulted happily. How many? Not one in a hundred. What percentage is that? 
Now, brothers and sisters, tell me something. Do you think the majority of the world are following the right plan? Then can we do what the world does and expect to get the results of heaven? It can't happen. That means that if the plan I give you is heaven's plan, it must be totally different than what we see being practiced in the world today. Are you with me? Now, everybody's not going to do it, but those who want happiness, they're going to follow it. Those who want heaven right here on this earth, if we follow this wonderful plan that God has given us, and we're going to look at that plan. In fact, we were building on that plan this morning. In Proverbs chapter 11, notice what the Bible says. In Proverbs chapter 11, we notice that a broad foundation had to be built in order for a courtship, a relationship, or a marriage to be able to be placed upon it and to last so that when the storms of practical life come, it does not destroy the house. We looked at that brow foundation. We're not going to go back into it this morning, but you remember that it was really the double lesson of love and what? Self-control. We liken them to the two pedals in the car. One, love is the power to do what? To go. Self-control is the power to slow down or to stop. Are you with me? That if you're in a car, your life depends on knowing how to use both of those pedals. And so in the experience of courtship in life, and most people have been wrecked, and we found that love, we manifested in three ways in the home. What was it? Obedience, service, responsibility. We noticed that self-control was manifested in three ways. What was the three ways? Appetite, affection, and the passions. If a man, a young man, or a young woman is not trained to control their appetite, they are preparing themselves to give in to the passions in their teen years and in their adult years. You cannot control your passion or your affection unless you get the control of the appetite. Did you know that? And this is why the foundation has to, be laid, has to be laid. And then we said upon that foundation, then God has given us steps that lead into this experience of marriage. Now, the seventh step, we notice from the Bible where we got those seven steps from. And we notice that the prophet said, in the book Adventist Home, page 49, the prophet said that every step toward a marriage alliance should be characterized by principles, simplicity, modesty, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and to honor God. We notice that. Then we looked at these seven steps, and we found that the final step ends in what? So the seventh step is marriage. Is that right? What is the sixth step? Engagement. The fifth step is what? Courtship. Now, what was the definition of courtship? What is courtship? Is it dating each other, playing a dating game? Uh, no, it's not necessarily preparation of marriage. You know, properly speaking, but I appreciate these answers because we're in a class. It's all right to study. But properly speaking, let me tell you something before we go on. Properly speaking, a man is not ready to court until he's ready to get married. Did you know that? You don't enter into courtship until you're ready to be married. Now, I did not say that the first person you court is the one you're going to marry. I didn't say that. But ideally, if you're going to enter into courtship, it means that you're already prepared for marriage. You're not ready for courtship unless you're ready for marriage. Are you following me? And so courtship is not a preparation for marriage. Now, that must happen before then. But, but, but what is courtship? Somebody's, somebody's been taking notes. Praise God. We have a class. Amen. A sincere and earnest effort of two to find out whether it is what? God's will for them to be married. They're trying to figure out the will of God. Now, most people, if they're interested in the opposite sex, if they're thinking about courtship and marriage, they believe that as soon as they get an urge, I'm going to say this, please. We're in a very, you know, this is a beautiful class. It's all right if we're talking back and forth. But if you feel that you need to talk to each other, then this is not the class, amen? There's another class outside that you can have if you want a meeting like that. But in here, we're going to be talking to each other, and we're going to be talking about here because, see, the enemy would love to distract us from the point, amen? Now listen. Courtship, as we said before, is the earnest effort of two to figure out or find out if it's God's will for them to be married. Now most people, they have an urge in their teenage years or in the, as they grow up to even come to the opposite sex, they believe that the first thing that they do is to jump into courtship. But we said, as we looked here and built the seven steps, that there are four steps before you ever even get to courtship. Is that right? Now what the world does, they skip over these four steps and they call it dating. 
They slide past these four steps and they do, as we said this morning, something that's called falling into love. You ever heard that? Oh, I fell in love when I saw this girl or this guy. You know the Bible doesn't speak of falling in love? And I told you earlier that I might remind you of a law of physics. You don't fall up, you fall, guess where? Down. The only way to go up is to ascend the stair steps that God has given us that takes us to the marriage alliance every step. And we proved that from the Bible. We looked at that. So we need to, this, this, this night, we need to find out what these four steps are. Is that right? Provided that we had this foundation right here and years of this foundation experience so that we have a foundation in which to put this step upon. So now I bring in a most powerful principle. As we look at this first step, go in your Bible. I'll come back to Proverbs 11. 1 Corinthians 7. What book can I say? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And let's notice what the Bible says. The first question that needs to be settled. What do you think the first question that needs to be settled as we start off moving toward what we would call a step toward marriage? You know, most people, you know what they think it is? They go into the church and they say, well, now, here's a young man. He looks like he's a preacher or a spiritual. Let me choose him. Or a young girl or a young lady. Oh, she looks like she's wholesome. She looks nice. I think I'll choose her. Mary, Alice, Sue, Jack, John. We choose these people like this, but do you know that's not the first question? You know what the first step is before we do anything? You know what the first step is? The first step is to ask the question, is God calling me to marriage? Not who should I marry, not when should I marry, but is God calling me to marriage? And somebody says, well, pastor, isn't God calling everybody to get married? No, he's not calling everybody to get married. Did you know that? Did you know that it is not the will of God for everybody to get married? Did you know that? So some people just automatically believe. They say, well, well I got to get married. But, but, but no, in fact, did Jesus get married to anybody on earth? Why not? It was not the will of God for him to be married on this earth. Did you know that? What about John the Baptist? What about Elijah? So it's not God's will for everybody to get married. So the first question should be asked, not who should I marry, not when should I be married, but the question is, is God calling what? Me to be married. Now let's read that in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Here Paul is admonishing about the idea of relationships. And in 1 Corinthians 7, notice what he says, beginning in verses 6, the Bible says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Verse 7, For I would that all men were what? Even as myself. What's he talking about? He was talking about and recommending a single state. Was he making a law? But he was recommending a single state. And there are reasons why he was doing this. But he was recommending that for certain reasons that certain people should be single. But did he say that everybody was going to be single? In fact, it goes on to say in the next verse. It says, for I would that all men were even as myself. Verse 7. I would that all men were even as myself. But, but, but. What does but mean? So while he may want to recommend and say, I wish everybody was single, he says, but I know something else by inspiration. What does he know? But every man hath what? His proper gift of God, one after this manner, and what? Another after that. What is he really saying? He's saying, I would recommend to some or to many a single state, but I know that God has called some people to get married after this manner and some people not to get married after this manner. So some are to get married and some are not. So the question is not, is everybody getting married? Because that wasn't the will of God for everybody. But the question is, is God what? Calling me to be married. That's the first question we need to ask. Is God calling me to marriage? And will God answer us if we ask him? Will God answer us if we ask him? Yes. Now, brothers and sisters, once we ask this, closely link with that, and we'll put this in still number one, is God calling me to get married right now? Is everybody supposed to get married at the same time? There is a time for everything under the sun. Is that right? There's a time for everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. There is a time 
and a purpose for everything under the sun. And so we need to know, is it time? You see, a teenager does not need to get down on his knees and ask God, now, Lord, show me, is it time for me to get married? No, God is not going to answer him. You know why? You know who will answer that teenager, though? The devil will answer that teenager. God won't answer him because it's not time for him to get married. And so we must then do this and first understand, is it time for me to get married? Is God calling me to marriage? That's the first question. Number two, after we ask, is God calling me for marriage? The second step is, if favorably, if you ask God, he says, yes, I'm calling you to marriage, and we'll talk about how in a moment. But if he says, yes, I'm calling you to get married, the second step now isn't, now who am I going to marry? First step, is God calling me to marry? I put, is God. Second step, under number one, you'll say, is it time as well. Second step, am I prepared for marriage? Because if God is calling you to marriage, doesn't mean you're ready to get married at that point. I'm asking you out there. If God is calling you to get married, does it mean that, it, that, that, that you're prepared to get married at that point? Doesn't necessarily mean that. There's a preparation that must be made. We looked at this foundation, and the preparation includes this broad foundation we've been talking about. Have you learned to master? You see, in the teenage years, what parents should be training our young people to do and what young, young people should be mastering is are they practicing love, obedience, service, and bearing responsibility in their home? Are they exercising self-control in the area of appetite and affection and passion? Are they manifesting this experience with the Lord so that they can hear when God speaks to them? Are they ready to even engage in the courtship? Because it's not like going out, you know, some people say they do window shopping. You know what window shopping is? What is window, sh what is window shopping? Somebody come to you, you, you ready to buy something yet? No, I'm just looking. No, that's not, how, that's not courtship. I'm not ready to buy yet, but I'm just looking. God is not expecting us to enter in anything like that. When we get into courtship, it is because we are prepared. I didn't say perfect, but we are prepared to now engage in a family. Now engage to bear the responsibilities of having homes of our own. Now, how does God test us to know if we're ready to have homes of our own? In the parental home. You remember we read that message, young people, 466? And you can write down in your notes, Luke, the 16th chapter. In fact, let's read that. Luke 16, then we'll come to Proverbs 11. Luke 16, notice what it says in Luke, the 16th chapter. In Luke 16, beginning in verses 12. Let's read that together. Luke 16, beginning in verse 12. And write in your notes, messages to young people, page 466, beside that verse. Luke 16, let's read that all together, beginning in verses 12. What does the Bible say? And if ye have what? Now, do we have our Bibles? Just raise your Bible if you have your Bibles. You have your Bibles? I'm questioning you upon the text. Luke 16, 12. Let's read it together. It says, And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is what? So if you have not been faithful in your parental home, in the home that you now belong to, why would God give you a home of your own? Do you follow me? And so God, in testing us, if you're faithful in least, you'll also be faithful in much. God test us in the home. Are you bearing responsibility? Because there are too many men that have taking on the responsibility of a wife, and they bring children into the world, and child guidance says it is a sin to bring children in the world, and you can't provide for them. And there are men today that will take on the responsibility of a family, but they're not willing to bear the responsibility because they never learned these lessons in the parental home. They're not ready to have a family. They can be 30, 16, 60, but if they don't understand these principles, they are not ready. And our young people need to be taught this. They can't just wake up 12 o'clock in the day, have nothing to do at home, and then believe that they're going to become good men and women that are ready for homes of their own. And if we're not ready for that, don't even think about courtship. Because if you engage in that type of courtship, you know who is going to be guiding you? The devil. First question. Is the first question, when am I going to get married? What's the first question? Is God calling me to marriage? Second question. 
f- provided that the, the second one was favorable, the first one was favorable, then you say, am I prepared? But now in this third principle, I bring out the most powerful point now. In the book of Proverbs chapter 11, probably one of the most powerful points that we can bring in as we deal with this subject today. Proverbs chapter 11. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, what I'm about to tell you today almost seems old-fashioned, but I make no apology for it. I simply say, say what Jeremiah 6 said. I ask for the old way in that good path, and I rejoice in those ways. Because God has given us truth, and the Bible has not changed. Fashions may change. Customs may change. But the word of God stands how long? Jesus doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And though it has become fashionable to do things differently, God's principles are the same. Now, in Proverbs, the 11th chapter, I want to read something to you. Very interesting. We'll read it together. Proverbs 11. I want you to read verse 14. Let's read it together. What does it say? Where no counsel is, is, the people what? Now, I might add, the people fall in love. Where no counsel is, the people do what? See, this is the third step. Watch now. It says, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of what? Of counselors, there is safety. Do you know that in this little book, in both of these books, Adventist Home, Messages to Young People, they have a whole chapter, and Messages to Young People is called The Need of Counsel and Guidance. Call when counsel is needed, you'll read statements such as this. Listen to what this says. You'll see how significant this really is. Listen to what this says. You're going to Proverbs 15. This says, The underhand way, 447, thank you, 447, 448, bottom of the page. It says, The underhand way in which courtships and marriages are carried on is the cause of a great amount of misery, the full extent of which is known only to God. On this rock, what rock? Uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, uh. It says, talking about the way in which courtships are carried on it says the full extent of which is on is known only to god on this rock thousands have made shipwreck of their souls what rock that rock of improper courtship and marriage it says professed christians who whose lives are marked with integrity and who seem sensible upon every other subject so you look at them and they look like Christians. On every other subject, they look to be in line with the principles of God in diet and dress and some of the other things and the reforms that God has given us and in the standards he's held high, but it says they seem sensible upon every other subject, make fearful mistakes here. Where's here? Wrong courtship and marriage practices. It says... They manifest a set, determined will that reason cannot change. They become so fascinated with human feelings and impulses that they have no desire to search the Bible and come into close relationship with God. I think it's serious. What do you say? Now, brothers and sisters, it says, without counsel, the people fall. Proverbs 15 says in verse 22, let's read that. Proverbs 15, verse 22, what does it say? Without counsel, purposes are what? Are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are what? So now, brothers and sisters, if we begin to get into courtship without counsel, we are going to fall and not be able to stand. Are you with me? Now, this chapter says when counsel is needed. Now, my question is, who are we to counsel with? There are three channels. And which we're to counsel with. What did I say? We're going to build those channels tonight. There are three channels. And which we're to counsel with. Who is the first? Adventist Home 70. It says on the chapter when counsel is needed. It says if there is any subject. That should be considered with calm reason. And unimpassioned judgment. It is the subject of marriage. If ever the Bible is needed as a counselor, it is before when? 
before taking a step that binds persons together for life. Now, and then he goes on to say, if men were in the habit of praying twice a day before they contemplated marriage, they should pray, guess how many times? Four times a day. So how many times a day should we pray if we're even contemplating courtship and marriage? No, that's not right. See, you didn't apply the principle. It didn't say pray four times a day. It said, if you have been praying two times, then pray four times. In other words, you must double your prayers. Are you following me? That's how serious it is. If you pray three times a day, you need to pray how many times? Six. Daniel, if he was getting ready to be courted and married, he would have not prayed three times. He would have prayed six times. We had a double our prayer life. I remember when my wife and I, as we were courting, every Friday we would fast and pray that God would show us what his will was. It's a serious thing, brothers and sisters. Now, this says the first that we're going to be counseling with is who? God. Now, how is God going to speak to us? Is he going to send an angel from heaven? Is he going to send an audible voice? Probably not. He is going to speak to us, and there are three ways in which God speaks. You write down in your notes, volume 5, page 512. He's going to speak through the word of God. He's going to speak through providence. He's going to speak through all oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. He's going to speak through the Holy Spirit as he does what? Makes impressions upon the heart. God speaks these three ways, and we're going to be praying, Lord, I want you to speak to me through these three channels. But we're not only counseling with God, we're praying as we're getting ready. Lord, and remember now, all of these steps, all seven of them are steps of counsel. Did you hear what I said? All seven of them, even for number one, when you say, is God calling me to marriage, are you going to know the answer yourself? So when you go to God in these three, as we build the channels, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to God and say, now, Lord, are you calling me to marriage? And then you're going to study the Bible and say, now, Lord, impress the particular texts that are appropriate to my case that show me. You're going to study the testimonies. You're going to look for providence where God will bring providential circumstances that show you whether he's calling you to marriage or not calling you to marriage. And he's going to make impressions upon your heart. And you should be saying, Lord, now impress my heart to know, are you really calling me? But the first thing we should always look for is not the impressions. It's not providence, but first what? The word of God. Are you with me? But not only are we counseling with God, who else are we, going to, are, are we to counsel with if we understand these principles? And that's not what inspiration says, but I, I will read what inspiration says. We're getting close, but watch now. Message to young people. Listen to what it says, 449. It says, take God, who? God and your God-fearing parents. Now, is there a difference between a parent and a God-fearing parent? What is the difference? I'm asking you. What is the difference? Someone, can someone tell me the difference? What is the difference between uh, someone who, can someone tell me the difference who haven't spoken yet? What is the difference between uh, just a parent and a God-fearing parent? Is it possible that you can have a parent? Now, while we're to respect all parents, whether they love God or not, we're to respect them. But some parents don't not have the ability, God-fearing, to give counsel based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And so if they counsel you, they could tell you to marry somebody who God never intended for you to marry. And in those cases, we are to obey God rather than man. Is that right? But still, it says we're to counsel with who? God-fearing parents. Now, to every parent in this room, that's a charge for us to become God-fearing, isn't it? But not only are we to counsel with God-fearing parents, Who are the third channel? We counsel with God. We counsel with God fearing parents. Who are the third channel that we're to counsel with? Someone says a brother. Messages to young people, I'll read it. 445. Messages to young people, it says, The young have many lessons to learn. How many? And the most important one is to learn to know themselves. It says, they should have correct ideas of their obligations and their duties to their parents and should be constantly learning in the school of Christ to be meek and lowly of heart. While they are to love and honor their parents, they are also to respect the judgment of men of experience with whom they are connected in the church. 
So who is the third line? Men and women of experience, I'll put that there, of whom they're connected with in the church. Are you with me? I'll read another page. Adventist Home 71. It says, It says, when so much misery results from marriage, why will not the youth be wise? Why, will they, why won't the youth be wise? Will they continue to feel that they do not need the counsel of older and more experienced persons? So this third channel is older men and women of experience in the church with who we're connected. What are the three channels? What is the first? The second? And the third. Now, do you see how wise God is? He's made provision. Everybody has access to God. Is that right? Everybody may not have had God-fearing parents, did they? But all of us can come and have men and women in experience in the church that can be, as it were, God-fearing parents that can help us so that none of us are without excuse. Are you with me? So when we talk about, am I, is God calling me to marriage, who am I going to counsel with? First, I'm going to go to God, and I'm going to say, now, God, are you calling me to marriage? Then who am I going to go to? My parents, God-fearing parents. And say, now, talk to them. Lay the matter open before them. Do you think that God is calling me to marriage? Who knows better than your parents all about you? And then you're to go to men and women of experience in the church of whom you're connected, and you're to say, do you believe God's calling me? And they're all counseling you now, and you're praying. And then they come to the point, provided that God and all these three come together and say, yes, God is calling you for marriage. Then the next question is not who, but what? Am I prepared? But be, you don't just say, well, I think I'm prepared. You know how many young people think they're prepared? You know how many young women think they're prepared already? In order to find out we're prepared, we got to counsel again, because without counsel, the people fall. They're disappointed. We go down to God again and say, now, Lord, am I prepared? He talked to us through the three channels. Then we go to our God-fearing parents, and we say, now, parents, I'm thinking about marriage. I think God is calling me to get married. Do you think I'm ready for marriage? Who knows better than you, than your parents, how faithful you've been in the home? Because if you're not faithful in your home, do you think you're ready for a home of your own? So as you counsel with your parents, they may say, you have not. And if your parents understand, they will be looking to see if you understand these principles. And they talk to you about it. They counsel with you. And if you're not ready yet, you don't go to step three. You work on building that foundation, mastering those principles until God, your parents, and the counselors say, oh, we believe you're ready. Somebody says that's old-fashioned. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Now, then it goes on to say, then we're to counsel with men and women of experience in the church. But now step number three is, now let's say that God, our God-fearing parents, and all the counselors all agree. They agree, yes, John is to get married. Yes, John is prepared for marriage. He's not perfect, but he's prepared. He's had an experience in practicing these points. He's prepared. He's been faithful in his home. He's now prepared to think in courtship. Now the third question is, who? Who? Was the third question? But now, is John going to say, now I wonder who I'm going to get married to and go out into the church. Where's John going to counsel? Now, let me tell you this. Counsel is not going to people that we want to agree with us. Counsel is not going all over the church until we find somebody who thinks like we do and say, I got to have her, and try to find somebody to agree with it. That's not counsel. You follow me? Counsel is you want somebody to be honest. Is this really a right? I remember, I remember I, when I was younger, and, and, and my parents knew some of these principles, although I didn't practice them sometimes. And I remember... I had a Philistine that I was uh, dating. I was like Samson. <laughs> and I brought her to the house one time, and my father was like, who is this? <laughs> and uh, I didn't see a problem with him. I, I, thought, I thought it was all right. But she was not a woman that I could ever be married to. And had I chosen out on that, you know I would have missed out on heaven sitting in the back row. Amen! Amen. Counsel is very important. We counsel not with our own selves because there is a way that seem of right. 
But where there's a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So now we counsel with God about who? Now, Lord, who is this? Who is the best person? Not only do we counsel with God through those three channels, but then we go to our God-fearing parents. And we say, now, parents, who do you think will be the best person for me? You know all about me. Who do you think will be the best person for me? This is old-fashioned, isn't it? As old-fashioned as the Bible is. Somebody said that they asked a question. They said, you be practical. Now, you said, give yourself to the Lord. But what are we to do? I'm telling you what we're supposed to be doing. Did God arrange the first marriage? Adam did not go in search of Eve. In the sense that he was looking through thousands. Eve did not go to Adam. The Bible says in Genesis 2 that God brought her unto the man. He arranged the marriage. And then Adam looked and saw what God was pointing to. And he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He said, this is the one. This is the one, Lord. He accepted God's choice for him. Who arranged the marriage? God did. Who brought the woman? God did. Now, God still wants to arrange the marriages today. Did you know that? Provided we follow these steps that we're talking about right here. And so we say, who? Now, you're saying now you're counseling with God. You're counseling with God for your uh, parents. You're counseling with men and women of experience. And let's say, they say, now you're ready. John's ready. John's prepared. And they look in the church as they've been praying together. And they found, as they went to the Lord in prayer and study, they praying four, six times a day. Now they get counsel from God. And all are agreed that Mary is the girl for John. God has given him indication. His God-fearing parents says, yes, this is a proper girl for you. And many women have experienced in which is connected said, yes, this is the one. Mary's the girl. Now tell me. Now three is who? Now tell me. Does John now go and say, now Mary, I want to court you. Time to start dating. What does he do? Now he's already counsel with his parents, right? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't make a move on counsel. He's already counseled with his parents about who. And they all agreed and said, Mary's the one. What does he do now? I heard someone say he goes to Mary's parents. Are you, in 2007, go to Mary's parents? Step number four. You account, you're the counsel with Mary's three counselors. You're the counsel with Mary's God. You've been doing that, Amen. You are to counsel with Mary's parents. And you are to counsel with Mary's men and women of experience to see if this is the girl for John. She, Mary needs to know too because if Mary is not just going to accept, you, you, now do you, Mary is not just going to accept that if she understands Christian principles, she wants God's choice. And this says that he is afraid to choose for himself, the true Christian. He will make no plans heaven can approve. He wants God to choose for him. Now, do you know why all these four steps are there before courtship, which is the fifth step? To save us from wasting time with girls and men that we never have no business with. Do you know that a Joe Blow on the side of the street with his hand, pants hanging down, he will never get to step five? It would be an abomination. If someone were to come up to my daughter and believe that they're going to get to step five, I would say, brother, don't ever step a foot in my house with that foolishness. You see, queens and princesses are protected. They're treated as royalty, not in a, oh, selfish and hateful way, but because our women are special. Young women, do you know how precious you are? And even older women, you are precious. God will not cast his pearls before swines. And you know what swans are just a symbol of? It's a symbol of unholiness. You remember that when God wanted to show people that were considered unholy, he used the animals. Swines were considered unholy. So in other words, God will never put his pearls of women before unholy men. He won't do it. And so this is why these steps, these are preliminary screenings so that we don't waste time with women and men that we never had no business with from the very beginning. In fact, I remember I was just talking to a pastor just the other day. and to the
And he was telling me his young daughter, his, well, she's old now, but she was a daughter, and she was almost getting ready to get married, and she was married to a pretty boy. You know what a pretty boy is? Well, she wasn't married to him, but she was dating this pretty boy. They got into an, not an accident, but they blew, the, they, they, the tire blew out, blew out on the road. The man sat in the tire and did not know how to change a tire. Did you hear what I said? The man was so pretty he didn't know how to change a tire. He said, no, I'm not dirty enough this clothes. No, you change the tire, sister. She had to call somebody to change the tire. You think she's going to enter into step number five? You know what happened? Now she, now she knows better. Immediately she said, no, 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 this is not the one. The father said, praise God. <laughs> Amen? He was not ready to bear what? Responsibility. Do you see? Most young men today don't know anything about bearing responsibility. They've been raised up in a home where they, they can just do whatever they want. They're not ready for this. Do you see what I'm saying? And as a result of that, he was able to be saved from this courtship. But she was dating because she skipped all these steps and was just wasting her time. Do you see what I'm saying? And the only way not to waste time is to know the will of God for us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, why is it? Because somebody would say, this doesn't make sense. Why is it that we are to go to Mary's parents. Why not go to Mary? She says Mary doesn't know what she wants. That's only part of it. And that's the lesser part of it. You know why? No, no she doesn't know herself. Mary does not belong to Mary's self. Did you know that? If Mary is a Christian girl who knows these principles, Mary knows that she belongs to somebody. Did you know that? And if her parents understand these principles we are studying, her parents understand that Mary belongs to somebody. You know who Mary belongs to? Well, he belongs to God, that's true. But you know who else Mary belongs to? Mary belongs to Mary's parents. You see, we do things and we don't think about it. Have you ever seen in a wedding ceremony? That at the proper time, the minister will say, who gives this woman to be the wife of this man? And at the appropriate time, who steps forward? Who, who, who says him? Either the father or some other guardian that has taken the place of the father. Maybe an older brother. Maybe another guardian or parent. Because that tells us then that all the way up until the wedding, Mary belongs to who? To Mary's parents or to our guardians. Are you with me? Do you know that we violate the Eighth Commandment by not following what we're talking about right now? Did you know that? Let me read something to you. Uh, you see, this is why we have a magnifying glass in the spirit of prophecy. Is that right? Listen to what this says. The question is asked, 446, messages to young people. The question is asked, wherewithal shall a young man clean his way? And the answer is given by taking heed thereto according to the word. The young man who makes the Bible his guide need not mistake the path of duty and of safety. safety. The, that blessed book will teach him to preserve his integrity of character, to be truthful, to practice no deception. How much? Now watch. Thou shalt not steal. What commandment is that? Thou shalt not steal was written by the finger of God upon the tables of stone, yet how much underhand stealing of affections is practiced and excused. A deceptive courtship is maintained. Private communications are kept up until the affection of one who is inexperienced and knows not where unto these things may grow are in a measure withdrawn from her parents and placed upon him who shows by the very course he pursues that he is unworthy of her love. In other words, when a man comes to get a wife, do you know that if he does not ask permission from her parents, not just to get married, but to even court her, he has violated the Eighth Commandment. What does the Eighth Commandment say? Thou shalt not what? Another name for stealing is taking something that does not belong to you. What is the only way that I can take something that does not belong to me and is not considered stealing? 
Do I ask for permission after I have her affections or before I even try to get to know who she is? So before you even get to know Mary, you know this says, now somebody, sometimes when I read, you almost have to rub your eyes and say, did I read it right? Yes, you read it right. <laughs> Listen, 445, a young man who enjoys the society and wins the friendship of a young lady unknown to her parents does not act a noble Christian part toward her or toward her parents. A young man who enjoys the society. What does that mean? A man that starts spending time with a young woman without he's ever talking to her parents. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about spending time with a young woman without talking to her parents. This says he's not acting like a Christian. It says, and this is, this is we don't follow the Bible so much, this seems almost out of date, but it's not. This is the truth. Now, somebody says, well, nobody in the world is following, and that's why we're told that there's not one marriage in a hundred that results happily, because these steps have not been followed. And as a result, by violating these principles, we enter into an experience that leads to hell and not to heaven. Now, not only are we violating the eighth commandment if we do that, but do you know that without consulting parents, we violate the fifth commandment? Did you know that? Adventist home. What does the fifth commandment say? Could you all repeat it with me? That their days may be what? Now listen to this. Now see, when I read these words, am I reading the opinions of a, of a woman or am I reading the testimony of Jesus? I told you yesterday, you could put it all in red. These are the red books. And the remnant church, they'll have it in the latter days. Jesus is speaking to us. And notice what he says. Question. Here's a young man. A testimony is written to a young man in relationship between him and his parents about this courtship question. It says, should parents, you ask, select a companion without regard to the mind or feelings of a son or daughter? In other words, here was a young man. And he's saying to the prophet, he wrote to the prophet, talking to the prophet, and he said, do you mean to tell me that my parents are supposed to choose from me? I'm a man! I can choose whoever I want. You mean to tell me that, I, that my parents must choose for me? Now notice the way the prophet responds. I love inspiration. Nothing inspires like inspiration. Look at what it says. I put the question to you as it should be. Now this is sweet. It says, not, not, that, not that I'm going to answer that question. He says, I put the question back to you as it should be. In other words, you didn't ask the question right. Listen. Should a son or daughter select a companion without first consulting the parents? When such a step must materially affect the happiness of parents if they have any affection for their children. This says that, that, that before a person, man or woman, is engaged in selecting a life partner, who should they consult first? Their parents. Now, brothers and sisters, what numerical value is first? First. It's first, isn't it? Should we do it last? Should we do it on the marriage day? You know, some people today, if you have fathers and mothers in this room, if a man came to their house before they were married and said to the father, you know, I'm planning on, John's planning on marrying Mary, and John says to the parents, I'm planning on marrying Mary. Can I have your blessings? Some parents would say, you know what? That was a Christian young man. I would not be, I would not be uh, flattered at all by such a thing like that. Because long before he ever entered engagement in marriage, he should have came to me before he even started talking to my daughter. Are you following me? Before he wins the society, before he carries on a friendship, she belongs to somebody. And I wonder if this is just for children that are 10 and 20. I wonder if it goes up to those who are a little bit older in years. How long is Mary somebody's? How long? How long? All her life, Mary belongs to somebody. Did you know that? First to her parents, and then she's given to her husband in the marriage. 
She's always protected as royalty, as a weaker vessel. There's not a moment in her life that Mary does not belong to somebody. I care not what her age, whether she's 60. Mary still needs some parents, doesn't she? Now, the question is, if you have not associated yourself with these three counselors, there's no way you can walk up these stair steps. If you are planning, if God's calling you, you need to make sure you know who these people are in your lives. Are you with me? So that you can begin counseling on these steps as God is leading up these staircases that lead to success. And when they come together now, when they all agree, first they're talking. Now, do we have an example in the Bible where this took place? That's right. In fact, the last chapter of Messages to Young People, it used the example of Isaac. Who chose from him? Do you know how old Isaac was? Forty years old. Forty? Who chose? Did he have these counselors? He had God? Did he have a God-fearing parent? Who was a God-fearing parent? Did he have men and women of experience? Abraham's servant was the actual one that did it. He was a man and experience of whom he was connected with in the church. Abraham's servant that knew Isaac better than anybody else. Everything in Abraham's house was under his servant, Eleazar. And he sent his servant, this God-fearing man, to go. So he had these same three channels. And when he went there, did he just go and pick up who, 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 was, who was he getting ready to marry? Who was Isaac getting ready to marry? Who was the woman? Starts with an R. Okay. <laughs> Amen. No trick question. Amen. Now, when he was getting ready to marry, did he just go and take her out of the land? Did he talk to her, did he talk to her parents first? When he talked to her, he talked to her first and said, he didn't even fully tell the whole mission. He said, take me to your house. Because he understood these principles. Now, her father was dead, so who was there that was acting as her guardian? Laban, her older brother. And as a result, he said, this is the plan. My master has all these things. My son has been trained. Everything he has is about to be given to him. He's been called by God to marriage. He's prepared, and you are the one. I was praying to God and said, whoever comes to the watering trough, this is the one. And you came. Providence worked itself out. You spoke to me, and I believe this was God. Now I need to know if you agree. Can this work? Laban said, all right. You know, this is God's. This is God's doing, of course. And then he talks to Rebecca. And Rebecca had the ability either to accept or to do what? Because remember now, this is counsel. It doesn't mean that Mary has to say, well... God said, uh, the people said I should get married, so I'm just going to get married. No, we have the freedom of choice. This is counsel. Are you with me? In fact, listen to what this says. It says, I put the question back to you as it should be. Should a son or daughter select a companion without first consulting the parents if they have any affection for the children? And uh, 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 it's, what this, it's, I'm sorry. When such a step must materially affect the happiness of parents if they have any affection for their children, and should that child notwithstanding the counsel and entreaties of his parents, persist in following his own course? I answer decidedly, no. Not if he never marries. I think that's very emphatic. It said, if he didn't consult his parent, it will be better he never married than if he didn't follow this counsel. Then it says, the fifth commandment forbids such a course. The fifth commandment does what? What does forbid mean? What does the fifth commandment say? What course does the fifth commandment forbid? Choosing somebody with our, without first counseling with what? Do you know that you have sinned if you chose somebody without first getting counsel from your parents? Because what is sin? The transgression of what? And what is one of those laws? The fifth commandment. Now, somebody will want to come to me and say, well, minister, my parent doesn't know. Well, this person, I'm talking about God for your parent. But they don't know all these things. They don't know. Surely this is right. Now, tell me something. Do I have the authority to change what these books have been, are written here? Now, there's a man over in Rome who has claimed that he has the authority to change what divine inspiration has written. And he has the whole world accepting that change every Sunday, doesn't he? 
but you don't believe him, do you? And if the Pope can't change what God wrote, what makes you think that we can? If the Pope can't change the fourth commandment, what makes us think that we can change the fifth commandment or the eighth commandment? Do you see? Now, if these principles were followed, the Bible says, in a multitude of counselors, there is what? There is safety. Now, when they get there, now you begin to courtship. And I'm getting ready to bring this, this, this study to a close. And then you enter courtship. What is courtship? The sincere effort of two to find out whether it is God's will for them to be married. Well, what are they going to do when they start courting? Go to Adventist Home 44. What book did I say? I said Adventist Home 44. Now, you should be taking this note so that when you go home, you can look at the same. Look at what it says, Adventist Home 44. Listen to this now. And we're getting ready to close here. Adventist Home 44. It says, marriages in the majority of cases is a most gallant yoke. Few have correct ideas of the marriage relation. Many seem to think it is the attainment of perfect bliss. But if they can know one quarter of the heartaches of many women that are bound by the marriage vows and chains that they dare not break, they would not be surprised that I trace these lines. Do you know? Now, let me say this before I go on. You know what the devil is doing right now as we study through these things? The devil would talk to some married couple and say, I don't have the right person. That's, that's real. That's true. You know that, right? That's what he was doing during these meetings. I got the wrong person. But inspiration says in Adventist home that God saw, that God showed Ellen White the two people were brought together by the devil. She said, but when that is, takes place, she says, they are to make the best of it. Once the marriage vows have been said, they are to make the best of it. And do you know that if they would do that, they could literally make the best of it? They could still have heaven on earth provided they follow God's plan? But after the marriage vows have been said, they are not to say, oh, now, let me second guess and no, it's over. Somebody says, well, what about people who can't, they just can't get along together. They're mated, but they're not matched. That's grounds for divorce, isn't it? In the courts of this world, but not in the courts of God. You stand married in the courts of God. Do you see? And so I'm not dealing with the married couple. I'm dealing with that couple who is not married yet that you can make sure you choose the right one. Are you following me? Now this says... The books of heaven are burdened with the woes, the wickedness, and the abuse that lie hidden under the marriage mantle. This is why I would warn the young who are of a meritable age to make haste slowly in the choice of a companion. To do what? To make haste what? To be quick to do what? So, you see, most of us, we're ready. And now I'm ready to get married. I'm ready to get married. I'm ready to get married. When am I going to let me go? When are you going to let me go? I'm ready to get married. We're ready to jump into it. And most people with marriages are unready because they have picked their mates before either one of them were ripe and ready. Remember I talked about that persimmon? What happens when you pick a fruit before it's ripe? It's sour. Even if it's the right person, if it's the wrong time. And so, brothers and sisters, timing, we are to slow down. And let me say this. As I close, does that mean, brothers and sisters, as we look at this, the way the world talks about courtship and dating, does that picture it as the world does when they talk about dating, where they have a knight in shining armor who comes and sweeps the young lady off her feet with roses and candy and all the rest? Does the inspiration picture a courtship like that? Where she just sweeps off their feet so quickly and it's love at first sight. Is that inspiration? And somebody says, well, you're taking all the romance out of love. You're taking all the rom romance out of courtship. Only a certain type of romance I'm taking out. And there's a reason for this. You know why? When you get emotionally attached with somebody, your mind is not ready to accept counsel. Did you know that? And this is why we're to be counseled before we ever get into this experience. Now see, once all this counseling has gone together, now it's time for young people to go together. These people that have been, that have been chosen, they went through all these preliminary steps. This is the time to go together, courtship. You know where they should go? 
You can read in Adventist home 44, 45, 46, through the rest of the chapter. One of the best places to go is to each other's homes. And the young man is to watch every development in that woman he's thinking about. He's, he's to study her character. He's to examine carefully. He is to go there to go to each other's homes. They are to go in connection with the work of God on missionary trips and practical work and lines of work to look at each other in different circumstances in this situation, in that situation, how she relates herself. Is she what she really is? And no one should try to deceive each other. Not a scheme, not a deception, not hypocrisy, not an act. We should let ourselves be who we really are. Because most people, some women, you know, I was hearing of a, a, a young lady, she married and her husband never saw her without makeup on. She would wake up early in the morning and put on lipstick and makeup because she said, I can't let my husband see me without this on. Was that really her? Or was it make-believe? Thou shall not make a lie. Thou shall not bear a false witness. You know what makeup is? Makeup is a deception, isn't it? Makeup! Amen? Don't make up lies. You violate the ninth commandment with makeup. Pretending to be something that you're not. And the husband, sometimes a husband, he said, well, if I knew you looked like that. <laughs> we need to let people see who we really are. Do you see what I'm saying? We're to study each other care. The same with the woman with the man. You're to watch him in connection with the work of God. You're to watch him in every circumstance. How does he act? How does he speak? Is it real? Does he have an experience? Is, it, is he ready to do these things? Is he ready to study each other's character? And somebody says, but isn't there a place for love and affection? Yes, there's a place for love and affection, but it's not in the beginning of courtship. The expressions of love are best reserved until the marriage relation. Did you know that? Until every question is settled that needs to be settled because men will so get so emotionally attached that they know this is not the right one. But as Proverbs 7 says, they will be walking to hell and putting their own head in the block and say, I'm just going, just walking to hell, just walking there like a sheep being led to the slaughter. You know how many men have done that? They knew they shouldn't have done it, but they let their impulse, their feelings, drive them and pull them in the wrong direction. Now, every one of us knows that the seventh commandment says, Thou shalt not do what? Commit adultery. And anybody who studies, they know that even if you're courting, the physical union is to be reserved to win after marriage but this is not only talking about the physical union but even those earlier expressions of love like the kiss and the caress the touch all of that is to be reserved did you know until after the marriage that's why when the pastor he stands up and he talks before the two and he says to the, the man you may now kiss the bride now, if you've been kissing all along, then you, you may now do it. You've been doing it all along. And the reason is simply this. If a man cannot keep himself from a thousand women, what makes you think he can keep himself from 999 women when he marries the one that he has? He said, the marriage vow, he must say, I'm going to forsake all others and give myself only unto this one woman. But if he's never practiced that, how can he do it? Do you see? If he's been touching whoever he wanted, kissing whoever he wanted, grabbing whoever he wanted, talking to whoever he wanted, first to this girl, then to that girl, then to the next, dating, dating, so the world calls it. If he's knowing all that, and then he comes to the marriage altar before God and holy angels and says, I promise for the rest of my life that I will never do it again. Well, how do you know? You've never demonstrated that you can do that. There must be a period of self-control demonstrated even before you enter the marriage. Do you see what I'm getting at? And we can't do that without Jesus, amen? 
But if we will follow these steps, while the majority of the world is not following it, and everybody may not have to follow, but if you want happiness, you will follow it. And what we have been teaching about is to pray that prayer, not my will, but do you want God's will to be done? If this is your desire, would you reverently kneel with me as we close? I don't need to say this. I, I, I think I may, I, I may have went over my time. I wanted to apologize to the next speaker. I didn't mean to do that. And I just want us to seal this with a prayer. That God will do something special for us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you love us so much. We're thankful, Lord, that we don't have to guess about anything. That you have shown us that we can build through thy counsel. Lord, we haven't made anything up. We read it all in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That there is a way that we can reach the Eden of bliss. That we can have heaven on earth. A little heaven to go to heaven in if we would just follow your plan, Lord. And many of us, we did not even come close to exhausting it. But we introduced your way. May we go back and study it in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and get acquainted with God, with you, Lord. To become acquainted with our parents and to become acquainted with men and women of experience in the church so that when we ask if we're being called to marriage, then we can actively participate in following your counsel, Lord. For without counsel we fall. We want not our will but thine to be done. And Lord, even if we've been married, we can go back, Lord, not to marry the person again, but to see wherein we have fallen and to repent and to do again thy first works. Oh, Father, I pray that you'll be with each person here of meritable age and that you would help them in this quest to find your will for their lives and the practical issues of life and that you'll be with the younger ones that they may learn to master the lesson of love and self-control. And that you'll be with each one of us that we might draw closer to Jesus. That we might know you, thus being prepared for eternity. That we may say with thee, not my will, but thy will be done. We ask that this might be our prayer in every experience of life. In Jesus' name, amen. together for these few moments we pray that your presence may remain with us we have enjoyed ourselves dear God we're thankful for the revival and reformation and we just ask that this experience may continue in Jesus name amen good evening good afternoon you know I think it's a blessing that we had this opportunity you know if you've ever been in anything and played sports, I remember when I used to play, I used to start as the point guard. And we would be in championship games, win the games, and all throughout the game, you know, the game would be going, sometimes you have a great lead, but then it would get to the crunch time. And about 10 minutes, you know, if you had a big lead, on you know, our team we had a big lead, sometimes 20, 30 point lead, and when that would happen, we would put in the bench warmers. You know what that is, right? The bench warmers would come in. But if ever the game was coming to the end, five minutes left, and that lead went down to five, Coach, whoop, you know what he brings in? Starting five, the starters. They're the crunch team. 
at the last moment. Are you following me? Now, God is wonderful the way he does things. Man, at the crunch time, would use the best players. God, at the crunch time, uses the worst players. Because, see, in worldly games, it is displaying the skill of man the power of man, the power of man, but in the great controversy, in the drama of the ages, the true, God is displaying the glory of the living God. And he's going to take the weakest of the weak to do the greatest work that has ever been done. Don't think that we're in this final generation just because we're somebody. It is because we're the weakest mentally, physically, and spiritually that God says, I'm going to take this weak generation and I'm going to do it. You know who gets the glory then? We, we don't get any of that glory, do we? What is man? The work of justification is to lay man's glory in the dust of the ground and to do for man what man could never do for himself. This is justification of my faith. Nobody's going to be in heaven and say, look at glory to me who has brought me here. There will be no song like that sung in the New Jerusalem, will it? When we get our crowns, we're going to throw them at the feet of God and say, heaven is cheap enough. Because we didn't have anything to do with it as it were. The power belongs to God and we just cooperated with him. What do you say? Now I want to share with you something. I'm not going to keep you here long. I was telling Pastor Taj <clears throat> that uh, he took my message. <laughs> I mean, almost almost verbatim I could show you point by point I said there's only one Holy Spirit isn't there we was going to go through seven principles uh, of, of preparation knowing if I'm prepared and by the grace of God he dealt with those seven principles and I was praying last night because in a meeting like this we have not even we just scratched the surface of these experiences you know that right now turn to John 15 we're going there we just scratched the surface in a meeting like this and so I was praying to God and saying, now, Lord, I can't deal with all this. All the essentials that need to be dealt with. I said, now, Lord, what do you want me to share with thy people? And I was wrestling with God as we were dealing with this. And when I came to the morning manna, I saw that the Holy Spirit did not even leave me to wonder. He said, that's already been dealt with. You don't need to deal with that. He's dealt with that already. I have a particular thing that I want you to deal with. And so we'll deal with that. But before we do that, I want us to just say this. Well, I'll say that when we get into the message. I'll say that later. John 15. My point is this. Don't use these instructions that you've, getting here, you've received here to beat yourself over the head with. Amen? Let me, let me explain what I mean. Some people will look at this and say, I'm married. I've never done this. I'm in the wrong relationship. I need to give up. You follow me? Some people will take these instructions. If anybody else has not done it that same way, they will beat them over the head. You're not doing it right because you're not doing it this way. That's not the purpose of God's instructions. Do you understand? Do you know why God has given us instructions? In either the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, do you know why he's given us instruction? To save us pain, that's true. John 15. Let's hear Jesus. And notice why Jesus gives us instructions. John 15, beginning in verses 12, uh, verses 11. Let's read that together. Let's pick up in verse 10, then we'll read in verse 11. Verse 10 says, If ye keep what? My commandments. Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Verse 11. These things have I what? So these are the reason, this is the reason why God gives instruction, either in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. It says, these things have I spoken unto you that you may beat yourself over the head. That my joy may what? Remain in you and that your joy might be what? So the reason why God gives us the details in everyday life in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy is because he wants our joy to be what? Full. Now if you have joy and it's full, then you are what? Joy full. Are you with me? He wants us to be joyful, full of joy. He wants us to be happy. You see, there is not one marriage in a hundred that is resorted happily. And the only way that he can make us happy, he must give us the instructions. It would almost be quite laughable if it wasn't so tragic. That those of us who know so little want to plan for our lives. Don't you think that's strange? 
that the great ar architect of the universe and human life that knows everything about us and everything that we can need or that we need to have happiness has given us all these instructions not to make us unhappy but because he wants us to be full of joy I think that's wonderful what do you say don't you want to be joyful don't you want to be happy well this is the way to have happiness and so for the next few moments we're going to be talking about happy is the home happy the home happy the home and so before we get into that short study this evening could you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer Oh, Father, it was almost, dear God, a sweet revelation to hear your voice speaking the same message to another. As I heard pastors say this morning that with Jesus and the family, happy, happy home. It reminded me, Lord, of the song that we sing over and over again to our daughter with Jesus and the family, happy home. With Jesus in our hearts, happy home. And so, Lord, we're just so thankful that we serve a God, and the real teacher is not man, but it is the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, may we not put our trust and dependence upon man. May we not flatter man, but may we give all glory to Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy to be appraised. May we recognize, and recognize Lord, that we are nothing, that our glory is shame and that the great thing that we have is the opportunity in this last generation oh dear Lord even as I think of it now and it brings joy to my heart that we can be the greatest evidence of how powerful you are because in our weakness your strength is made perfect oh thank you Jesus for this that even in our mistakes, that you can point to us and show that there is a God in heaven that can take a marriage that had no foundation and rebuild it. That you can take man that was created and lost everything and redeem him into an experience that we're told in inspiration that we are, the devil meant to destroy our relationship with you, but because of sin and your love, you are going to bring us into a closer relationship than we never could have should we had never sinned. We're so thankful, Lord, that you can do that in our relationships. Husbands and wives that have been divorced, that have been brought back together, many that have been separated, you can make it sweeter if we just come to thee. And even as individuals, Lord, if we just come to thee, oh, Lord, do something special in this last meeting that we may recognize that happy is the home where Jesus reigns. In Jesus' name we thank thee. Amen. In the book of Revelation, God has been pleased to represent to us his last message, his last movement, his last work under the figure of three angels flying in the midst of heaven with a most wonderful message. Isn't the three angels' message wonderful? Is there any message more wonderful than this? How much is in the three angels' messages? How much is in there? You know, when you read Revelation 14, verse 6, and the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. These angels, these three angels, are commissioned to proclaim the three angels flying in the midst of heaven. Now, when their work is complete, what is the result? Someone says, the end shall come. When their work is complete, how does John the Revelator picture what takes place next? You know the story. Revelation 14, 6. You know the result after that message is presented. What takes place in that chapter? What happens next? Something that has to do with agriculture. Jesus says, speaking through the Revelator, that the harvest of the earth is what? Is ripe. They're ready. The harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, what was it that made the harvest of the earth ripe? Those messages. Those three angels are God's message to prepare a people for the harvest, for the coming of Jesus. In other words, without those messages, no development of a people to meet Jesus. 
Without those messages, no harvest will be ripe. Those messages constitute the messages of this hour, the truth for this time. All that man needs are in those messages. Did you know that? Those messages have been super saturated with truth, everything we need. Not just when we think about just as we were today on religious themes, everything has a religious foundation, but I mean every subject, the relationships we've been talking about, they're in these three angels. Did you know that? Every experience of life is there. In fact, do you know who the 144,000 are? The 144,000, if I could give you a detailed description as it were, simply put, the 144,000 are simply those who understood the secret of life through the gospel. Did you know that? In Ministry of Healing, page 363, the prophet of God says, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Now let me say that again. The gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. What does simple mean? Something complicated? God will take the problems of this world and through the gospel, he simplifies and brings the solution to the problems that are now baffling the world's great men and statesmen and parliamentarians. Did you know that God intended that every Seventh-day Adventist were to be problem solvers? Did you know that? What Daniel was in Babylon, what Joseph was in Egypt, every Seventh-day Adventist is to be to the world. They understood the problem, and they knew how to bring the solution to the problems. And God, through the gospel, my friends, wants to teach us how to solve the problems of this world so that when we meet man, we can show them the answer to man's problems and bring the solution through the gospel. And the 144,000, they understand it not just theoretically, they understand it practically. Oh, how wonderful it is that we must be a demonstrator before a proclamator. You know that the high priest, when the high priest had his garments that was directed by God, you read in Exodus 28 and 29, that garment, do you know what was on the hem of that garment? A bell and a pomegranate. A bell and uh, then the Bible says like that, and you know when the Bible says like that, when you study, you have to slow down and read the Bible. When the Bible repeats something, inspiration, heaven only repeats that which is most important, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Why a bell and a pomegranate? Have you ever let your mind wonder, Jesus, why a bell and a pomegranate? All of these things were done for a shadow to teach us something. When the priest moved, did the bell sound? A bell was sounded. They could hear when the servants of God moved because every one of us are priests. You know that, right? We are a royal priesthood. But not only was there a bell, it was also a what? What is a pomegranate? Is it a vegetable? It's a fruit. By their fruits, you shall what? You shall know them. In other words, when the priest walked, he was showing not only did he make a sound with his mouth, but he was to represent the fruit in his life. So every minister of God, every man of God, every servant, they should not only sound the trumpet with their mouths, but the fruit should be in their experience. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Our life should testify. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, that though I spoke with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity or love, it profited me nothing. He said he would be as a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. It wouldn't mean anything without the experience of the fruit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? What is the first one? The first part of that is love. Is that right? Yes. And we're here talking about love and courtship and marriage and these experiences. Now, there are two things I want to bring out before we close. I'm not going to keep you long. Two things I want to bring out. Number one, I wanted to show you there's a reason why I brought these books out from the first night. Did you notice that every night I brought these books out? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I did it for a purpose. I wanted you to see that every principle we built did not come from my mind. Did you follow me? I wanted you to see that every principle we built 
came from the words and the books of inspiration because when man goes, these books are still here, aren't they? We don't need the ideas of men. All we need is the inspired words of the living God, brothers and sisters. Man is not smart. I remember somebody came to me. How do you know all this? It seems like you're understanding so many things. And they think that it's something in man. And I'll tell you a little secret. I said, no, you know what I do? I simply study the Bible with the magnifying glass of the spirit of prophecy. If we would just take these books out, cut off the televisions, Take these books out. Get together as a family. Groups coming together to study and start saying, let's go through the books to understand it. The children of Israel were supposed to be the head and not the... They were supposed to be the light of the world. They were to be the object lessons. When the world saw the children of Israel, they wanted to be what they were. God intended that the whole world would be beating a pathway to Israel's door, and they would say, I want what you have. They say, how your marriage is so wonderful. They weren't going to be like Hezekiah and say, because this is my precious things. They were to say, the reason why is because God has given us a prophet and the prophet has told us the words of Jesus that our joy may be full. They said, why are your children so different? Why are your educational system so different? Why is your, 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 your sanitariums the way they should be? Somebody talks about hospital. Why are your sanitariums like they are? Because we have a prophet. And that prophet links us back to God so that we come behind and no small gift. Revelation 12 says, 17 says that the remnant, they have something. They have not only the commandments of God, but they have what, everybody? The testimony of Jesus. That we have the privilege of having Jesus still to be among us through the words of the living prophet that has died, but the words are still here. The testimony of Jesus. That's wonderful. What do you say? In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Notice what it says about the children of Israel. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 4, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, <clears throat> Now therefore hearken, O Israel, and to the statute which I what? Who is talking? It says, For to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord, thy, which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you, ye shall not do what? Now please, uh, do you have your Bibles? Do you have your Bibles? Raise them up high. I hope you didn't come to this last meeting without your Bible. Amen. You know, when I was bringing out, normally the last session is the most important session. And I hope you wouldn't come without your Bibles in the most important session. Amen? We're among the remnant. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 4, look at what it says. It says in verse 2, ye shall not do what? Add unto the word. What does it mean to add? So you mean to tell me that when we look to solve the problems of life, we're not to add anything to it, we're just to keep it the way God said it? Not add our own opinions? Someone said the other day, well, what is your opinion on this? And I said, we don't have any opinions. Our opinions mean nothing. Amen. What God has given us is the word of the living God. And when inspiration is silent, we need to be silent. And when inspiration speaks, we need to speak. And I don't mind speaking what inspiration says because I know it's true. I know it can't go wrong. Deuteronomy 4 goes on to say, don't add to it. Then it goes on to say what? Which I, Which I command you, neither shall you do what? What does diminish mean? lesson. Don't take away from it. If inspiration says something, someone says, well, I don't need these four steps. Don't add to it or don't. Whatever God gives us, don't take away from it. Simply keep it just the way God gave it to us. Are you with me? It says don't add, don't take it away. Don't diminish that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Did you notice what it said? In other words, if you add to the commandments, you will end up not being able to keep the commandments. That's what the Jews did. You remember? The Jews added the Pharisees, they added commandment at the commandment, and they respected the commandments of men more than what? So as a result of adding to the commandments, they were not even able to keep it. Jesus said, you make burdens that you yourself can't even lift. So when you add to God's instructions, you make it so that man cannot practice those instructions. Are you with me? But not only do not add, in other words, if you diminish from it, you can't keep it either. And the only way to be able to keep the commandments of God through love means that we must keep them just as God gave them. Are you with me? Now, and if we do that, notice the result. Verse 3 says, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did, did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God, had destroyed them from among you. But ye did not cleave unto the Lord your God 
but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, when? This day. And then in verse 5 it says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Now notice verse 6. It gets sweet here. It says, keep therefore and what? And do them. Do what? Just talk about them. Just preach them. And do them. And then it says, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of who? You see, when we practice God's principles, the nations will look at us and say, surely this is a wise and understanding people. Look at what it says. Watch this. This is wonderful. It says, In the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this great nation is wise and an understanding people. Verse 7, all together. For what nation is so great? Who have God so what? Nigh or near unto them as the Lord our God is in all things things that we call upon him. In other words, the nation would say, who the nation is so great? Look at your family. Look at everything you do. It's so much higher than everything else. How do you do it? God is so near that he will give you instruction in every detail of your life. I want to be a part of your church. Do you see that? We would very little even have to do an evangelistic meeting. The people would just look at us and they say, I want to be a part of your church. They'll see your children. They would see your relationships. They would see everything we did, and they would want to be a part of us simply by seeing the fruit of following Jesus. I don't know. When those people came back from the Canaan land, and they bought those big grapes, can you imagine seeing a grape almost the size of this man here? <laughs> One grape! Can you imagine? Everybody's well, you know, I wouldn't mind going to Canaan and get that grape. Amen? <laughs> Amen! When we bring back the fruit from heaven, Canaan land was a type of heaven, the promised land. When we bring back the fruits from heaven into the wilderness of this world, when the people see that, they can marvel at the goodness of God. When they see the fruit of heaven on earth. Is that wonderful? And how is it that God wanted to do it for Israel? What did God give Israel so that they could be the head and not the tail? Go to Hosea. What book did I say? To the book of Hosea chapter 12, because you might have noticed that purposely, I read a lot from these books, didn't I? You heard me read from these books? Who wrote these books? Well, you might call them co-authors, amen? The human and the divine. We have the Holy Spirit who inspired them, and then who, who then put words to these? Human words. Ellen White, amen? Both of them together. The prophetic office was a, a blending of the human and the divine in inspiration. Now, in Hosea chapter 12, notice what the Bible says. Hosea chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Hosea chapter 12, the Bible says, now let me give you a little test. I believe some of you are students. You're students in here, amen? Now, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, the apostle Paul says, now all of these things have been written for our what? Our admonition. They've been written for our what? Before ad admonition, what did it say? They've been written for our in samples. You know what that word means, the original word that was used there? You know what the word means? You had a margin. It would say types. Like the lamb. When Jesus gave a lamb to represent Christ. Types. Representations, examples, symbols. He said, All these things happen unto them for in samples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are. So, in other words, if we understand that, what group of people was he talking about when he said, All these things happen unto them? Who is it then? The people before us specifically, he said that they were all baptized into Moses through the sea. In other words, the children of Israel. Is that right? God's ancient people. So everything in the Bible that happened to God's ancient people, they were types, examples that were written to warn us, to instruct us, to guide us upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10 11. 
So everything that happened to Israel is an example of what's going to take place in what days? The last days. Are you with me? Now, so in Hosea chapter 12, notice what it says about ancient Israel. It says in Hosea chapter 12, and remember that we're reading about something that's going to take place as instruction for us in the end of the world. The Bible says in verse 10, let's read it together. The Bible says, I have what? Who is talking here? God. I have also spoken by the... So when we read the prophets, who is speaking? God. And I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of what? By the ministry of the prophets. Then verse 13 says, I like this part. Read it with me. It says, and by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he what? Preserved. So the Bible says that God took ancient Israel out of Egypt, which was a type of sin, because in Egypt they were carrying heavy burdens, weren't they? And we're told that we're in bondage to sin and to this world. And so in Egypt, God took them out by what? What does the Bible say? I'm questioning about that, upon that text. Verse 13. He took them out by a prophet. Is that right? Now that is written for us in what days? So God is going to take us out of sin in the world by a prophet. Then it says, and by a prophet was Israel what? What does preserve mean? You know, those who eat healthy bread, those breads don't have what in it? Preservatives. Now, you know anything about healthy bread. If you take bread that's not healthy, you can put it on the shelf and it can stay there maybe two, three months. Is that right? You know what's inside of them? Preservatives. But when you take the preservatives out, what happens to the bread just after a few days? It spoils. What is the preservative to the remnant church? The prophet. Is that for what days? The last days. So all Satan would have to do if he wants to spoil us is to remove the preservative, which is what? So if he can get us to come to the place where we reject the prophet, we will spoil our inheritance in the remnant church. And this is why we're told that the very last deception of Satan is to make of none effect the testimonies of God's spirit. Because those who give up the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy, those that will not read and practice these books, their experience will be spoiled and they will be unready for the coming of Jesus. Because you can't be spoiled and pure. Purity is the sign of freshness. And when you're spoiled, you won't call that fresh or pure, would you? The only way to preserve that is by keeping these prophets. Now someone says, what does listening to the spirit of prophecy have anything to do with courtship and marriage? It has everything. Did you know that? Because by a prophet, God wants to preserve what God has given us from heaven. We don't have to add to anything. We don't have to take it away. All we need to do is go back to what? The books of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And if we would open up our hearts to these, the people that would look around us would say, surely this is a wise and understanding people. The ministry of Healing says, the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. I'll never forget. Now that's the first point. I said two points. Is that right? I'm going I'm to bring it to a close, the second point. But I want you to get this. Everything we study comes from this. Don't add to it. Don't take it away. Please, study the books. Get the books and don't just leave them on your shelves. Adventist home in your shelf will never make a happy home. Are you following me? Only Adventist home that is studied and practiced will make a happy home. Messages to young people that are sitting on your shelf will never make an army of youth. But messages to young people that is studied and practiced by young people and adults because messages to young people, that name might fool you. It's not just for young people. Child guidance is not just for children. The ministry of healing is not just to get sick people well. The ministry of healing is the great encyclopedia of life. I would say in one sense that the ministry of healing is one of the great apex of everything that has ever been written in the spirit of prophecy. Did you know that? In volume 9 of the testimony, 71, 70 and 71, the prophet says that the great wisdom of the physician was placed in the ministry of healing. I think that's wonderful. What do you say? 
I'll never forget. I was on a plane getting ready to do a meeting in another uh, country, and I remember as we was getting ready to, uh, to move and go, I was sitting, it was shortly after September 11, 2001. And I was sitting there on the plane, and I looked over to the right of me, and there was a man there, and he had some bomb schematics on his paper. And after September 11, my brother, I said, I think I need to talk to him about it. <laughs> I said, hey, brother, I said, I said wait a minute, now what is all that paper about? And he began to start talking to me about the paper, and he started telling me, he said, well, it's, it's not classified, so I can tell you. And so he began to start talking to me about what he was going, he was getting ready to do a, a go into a special meeting in, in, in Washington, D.C., and at, at the Capitol, and he was going to be doing some presentations there. He was over the Department of Defense of the United States of America. He was going to do a rush meeting. So we're sitting beside each other, and when I sit on the plane, I'm always looking to share the gospel of these three angels. So I have my Bible right there. I, I, you know, all you have to do is give me an inch. You, you know, my pastor was talking about the devil. You give the devil an inch, you know what they do? You know what the devil will do? He'll take a mile. You give him a, a, a hand in the door, he'll get in the door. You give me a, by grace of God, you give me an inch, I'm going in. And so we were sitting there. I had the Bible hand, you know, almost like those police. They open up the holster to the gun. So I'm, I had my Bible just, ready, just waiting as we were talking. We were just talking, talking. And I knew what his interest was. I knew he was interested in the war as we started talking. And so I said, you know, I'm interested in this war. And we started talking about the war. And I ran Iraq. And I said, you know what? I can tell you why this war is taking place. He said, what? what you can tell me why this? And we went to the Bible. And I took out my Bible. <laughs> Revelation 13. I started going through and explaining to him. He's, his mouth drops open. We're talking. Then I said, now I can tell you why you have a job. He said, what? Now I began to start going through the prophecies and why he had a job. He, he said, now I'm surprised, wondering what's going on. Then as we started talking some more and going through, and I began to start talking about the great final crisis that was going to take place in America and showing him that while he was sitting here, God wanted him to hear the message of an angel flying in the midst of heaven. Do you know that when you accept this message, you become that angel? Flying on jet planes and on radio cars and through the internet, you become that angel. An angel is a messenger with a peculiar message. And God has given us this message that we can solve the problems of this world. God should be able to take a seven Adventist, drop him off at the White House, and say, now solve the problems of this world. You know, in the book Education, I could grab it out and show you the page and reference of how to stop world hunger right now. The testimonies have given us. Every problem in life, we have been giving the answer and the solution because the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. And the answer is not complicated. It is simple that even a child can understand. And it has been written in this closing hours that children who have been rightly trained will speak forth words that is now will, now, will, will soon baffle those who now even talk of higher education like Jesus did in the temple at the age of 12. Children that are rightly trained can baffle just like that today if they're rightly educated. And God wanted us to have this, this solution through the testimonies. As I was talking to this man and we began to talk, and after he heard this, his mouth dropped open. He, was, he couldn't believe what he was hearing. And then very solemnly, he looked to me, and he said to me, do you believe the Bible has the answer to every question? I said, yes. He said, you believe the Bible, don't you? I said, man, I would not be teaching you this if I didn't believe it. He said, I just have one question. I'm about to get a divorce. Can the Bible help me? Now I've been thinking about all the stuff in the Bible. You know, when you read Daniel, when the question came to Daniel, can anybody, in the, any wise men in Babylon, and Daniel said, there's no one that can do this, but there is what? A God in heaven. I said, I better set the stage for our Lord Jesus Christ. So he looked at me and I said, no, I can't help you. And his face just dropped. I said, but, <laughs> but there is a God in heaven. And through his prophets, he has given us in the Bible the solution to the problems that now baffle the world. So now he's listening. And right there on the, stand, on the plane, we begin to go through a study of principles from the Bible of how to restore any marriage. 
And all I was doing was giving a magnification. I'm giving you, I'm letting you in a little secret. I was just teaching him what the ministry of healing says in the chapter, Builders of the Home. And all I did was just, just find the Bible because everything in the spirit of prophecy is in the Bible. I've been showing you everything we were reading here. We went to the Bible and showed the same thing, didn't we? The spirit of prophecy just magnifies it. You see, when you have glasses on, do glasses put something in a book that's not there? No. Glasses simply magnify what is there because the eyes of man has become so dim that they can't see it anymore. In the last days, we are Laodicea. We are blind. We can't see properly. In the Bible, it's everything we needed. But, 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 but because of this last generation, we have become so blinded spiritually that God says, I must give them some glasses. Now, you best understand, everything we need is really in the Ten Commandments. You know that, right? The whole duty of man is there. So why do we need the Bible? It magnifies what is in the commandments. The Bible is glasses to the Ten Commandments, but there are some of us in these last days, we need bifocals. The spirit of prophecy is the bifocals. The spirit of prophecy magnifies the Bible, and the Bible magnifies the commandments so that we understand the whole duty of man and the solution to the problems that are now baffling this world. When we finished talking, that man, I remember we was getting ready to land, and we were talking, he started asking all these different questions as we're going through this thing, and, and I said, well, you know, you're asking questions, it's going to take a little while to answer these questions. He said to me, we're just now about the taxi. You still have 15 minutes. I've done this trip before. You have 15 minutes. Keep talking. We started talking. We went through. It was so beautiful. And as we finished that man, as we got down there, he looked at me very solemn. He said, you don't know what you've done. He said, I have not touched a Bible since Desert Storm. Now, you know what year Desert Storm was? 91. It was 2001. He had not owned a Bible for 10 years. He said, one of the first things I'm going to do is go back and get these prophets. Get the Bible. Then he said, I was going to get a divorce when I came back from this meeting and Washington, he said, but now I know I don't even have to get a divorce. It can be sweet, heaven on earth. <laughs> then he said, I envy your life. And I said, no, you don't envy my life. He's really envying the life of Christ. He wanted to be a Christian, didn't even know it. In his heart, he was longing for it now. I want what you have. Do you know that the loud cry is going to be like that when people see that you have the answer in Jesus? They're going to be running for you. The loud cry is going to be of such a nature when you understand this with Jesus that even if you whisper, it will still be a loud cry. And then he gave me his card. He said, anything you need, contact me. He said, young man, I bet you sleep, sleep sweet at night. I said, yes, the sleep of a Christian is sweet. God wants to make us, brothers and sisters, the problem solvers. What was Jesus? He was a problem solver. Everywhere he went, whether he was solving problems in health, whether he was solving problems in finances, whether he was solving problems of food, he had a food conservation program, multiplying the fish and the bread, whatever the problem was socially with marriages, God was simply Jesus going from place to place solving problems. And if you can solve a person's problem, they don't mind listening to you. I'm closing on this point. I said two points, right? What does the spirit of prophecy have to do with relationships, everything? It gives us the teachings of heaven. Magnifies the Bible and the commandments so that we, our joy might be what? Full, finally. I'm reading from the book I have in his home. And we've been talking a great deal about courtship, right? What is courtship anyway, class? So I ever, you didn't have your notes out? <laughs> I gave you a pop quiz. It's a sincere effort to find out whether it is God's will for them to be married. Do you know why, you know, sometimes you almost forget why, you know, the devil is so slick what he does. I'm going to read you something. When I first read this statement, I had to almost rub my eyes and say, well, now, Lord, help me to understand this. I have in this home 55. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to come back and, and, and bring it, use it to bring it to a close. It says, do we have 10 more minutes? Do we have that? It says, the ideas of courtship. The ideas of what? I have it in his home 55. The ideas of courtship have their foundation in erroneous ideas concerning marriage. Now, you missed it. I saw it go over your head, but I'm going to come back to it. They follow impulse and blind passion. 
The courtship is carried on in a spirit of flirtation. The parties frequently violate mod the rules of modesty and reserve and are guilty of indiscretion if they do not break the law of God. So some may not commit fornication, but they, they come as close to it as they can without doing it. And Jesus said, that you don't even have to do it. You can, you can look at a woman in the wrong way and lust after her, and you've already done what? Committed adultery in your heart. Then it goes on. The high, noble, lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. The what? The high, noble, noble lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. What does that mean? You see, don't just read the Spirit of and say, oh, okay, say that. Stop and go back and understand what it means. I also want you to see how, how we're studying these books. Are you following me? In a very practical way. What does it mean when it says that the high, no, noble, lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned? Therefore, because of this, the purest affections of the heart, the noblest traits of character are not developed. Why? Because they don't understand the design of God in the institution of marriage. When God made marriage and designed marriage, he had a purpose for the institution of marriage. And most people don't know what that, that purpose is. And if you don't know the design of God for the purpose of marriage, then it's going to make sure that the courtship, you don't understand that either if you don't understand the marriage. Are you with me? I'll say it this way. I'll give you an illustration. I remember a young man that we were talking. He was in the ministry. He was in the ministry, I said. Because, see, the devil knows how to come through relationships that take you out of it. He's no longer in the ministry now because he didn't understand this point. You remember, men are sensible on every point that the enemy comes in and, and uses this. And you know what he said after my wife and I got married? He said, I can't wait to get married. And I only say this because of how serious this is. He said, I can't wait to get married. And someone said, Why? He said, because then I will have the permission of God to have sex. Is that the design of God in marriage? Now, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong. God made it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's God's purpose when entered into right. But brothers and sisters, is marriage simply a license from God and the state so that two people can have sexual intercourse? If that is what you think the design of God is in marriage, then that's the way you carry on your courtship in a flirtatious spirit. Are you following me? Unless we understand the high and noble and lofty principles of God in the design of God in the institution of marriage, we won't know how to carry on courtship. So that means we must better understand marriage even in order to understand courtship. Are you following me? Now let me read that first sentence again and tell me if you understand it this time. The ideas of courtship have their foundation in erroneous ideas concerning marriage. Do you see? So the reason why many people have a false and wrong idea of courtship is because they have a false and wrong idea of marriage. Are you following me? Let me read it again. The ideas of courtship have their foundation in erroneous ideas concerning marriage. They follow impulse and blind passion. The courtship is carried on in a spirit of flirtation, which means that they thought the marriage was nothing more than a union of flirtation. But there is a more high and noble and lofty principle of God, and I want to close because there's no way you can have a right idea of courtship unless you really understand the design of God and the institution of the marriage. Is that right? And I want to take these last few minutes. This, it, will be, it will be worthy to have a whole hour to study this, but we're going to condense it into a few minutes. What is the object of God and the institution of marriage? You see, if we understood this, then we'll understand why I message this to young people. We're told that the habit that most people do when they carry on courtship, one of the two great habits, message young people brought out two great habits, it says that young people will want to spend all their time absorbed in each other. In the society of one another. You ever seen that? Young people, get, they get attracted to each other, and all their waking moments, they want to spend on the phone or with the other person. Is that right? To the neglect of God and their relationship with him. Is that right? Sometimes the prayer meeting suffers. Sometimes the devotion suffers. And it's also true, not only in the society of other, but staying up late at night, not only on the phone, but in the presence of each other. You know that if you stay too long in the presence of that other person, then the tendency is that it prematurely draws you together emotionally 
before you really even understand the character. You have to learn how to be reserved. What does reserve mean? To hold back until every question is settled and you know this is the one for you. Are you following me? There's to be a sacred reserve and every one of these steps is to be done with simplicity, modesty, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and honor God. Is that right? Now let me say it very simply. John 17. What book did I say? John the 17th chapter. The Bible says in John the 17th chapter, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Do you know that the spirit of prophecy says? Well, let me ask you this way. If there was one chapter you could have in the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, if there was only one chapter in the entire Bible, which one would you take? He said, Revelation 14, that's a good one, isn't it? Which one do you say? Genesis 1, that's a good one. Which one do you say? Exodus 20, that's a good one. Now, all these are good ones. But you know what I read in the Spirit of Prophecy? I read in the Spirit of Prophecy what the prophet said, that more is comprehended in John, the 17th chapter, than in any other test, chap, chapter in the New Testament. Did you know that? That more is contained in John, the 17th chapter, than in any other book in all of the New Testament. That would tell me if I had only a New Testament, you know what book I would want? You know what chapter I would want? John 17. Now the Bible says in John 17, Jesus now, just before he goes to the cross, just before he gets into Gethsemane, and when a man is about to die, he gives his most important instructions. In verse 1, the Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may do what? Glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Verse 3, can we all read this together? This is the point. This is the great object of life. This is the purpose. This is the design of God in any institution that he has made. The Bible says in verse 3, And this is what? Life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast. What is the great object of life? To know God. What is the reason why he gave us the Sabbath? Ezekiel 20 says that it is a sign between me and my people, not only that I sanctify them, but that they might know that I am their God. The Sabbath was given to us that we might enter into a relationship with Jesus, that we might know him. The Sabbath was made for man. What, what was it made for? It was made that we might do you know that if we truly kept the Sabbath, there would never have been an atheist that did not know God? The great purpose of it is to know God. But remember now, the Sabbath and marriage are indissolubly linked, meaning that you cannot separate them. So the purpose of God in the Sabbath is the same purpose of God in the institution of marriage. The purpose of God in marriage is not simply so that your pleasures can be solved. It's not simply so that physically you can just have a companion to talk to. Oh, that's beautiful. That's like an icing on a natural health food cake. Praise God. It is just adding more to it. But that is not the object, the purpose, the foundation. And because many do not understand this, they think that they either need to get married or they carry on a wrong form of relationship. What is the purpose of God is the purpose. The purpose is that we might, that we might know him. Now how is it that a marriage can help us to know God? First John. What book did I say? First John chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says. In 1 John chapter 4, the Bible does not lead us to gout, de, ga, guess about this experience. In fact, John the Revelator, here the Apostle John, inspiration said that he wrote with a pen, as it were, dipped in love. He knew about love, didn't he? 1 John chapter 4, John the Beloved, notice what he says. 1 John chapter 4, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Beginning in verses 7, let's read it together. The Bible says... Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. And what is the object of life? That we might know him. What shows us if we know God? If we love him. It says, let us love one another. So by loving people, we reveal that we know who? But do you know it is not only in receiving love that we show that we know God. It is also in, guess what? In giving love. We must both receive love and give love in order to enter into an experience where we know him. If all we do is being showered with love, we don't know God yet, do we? We love him because he... Verse 8 tells us again. It says, he that what? Loveth not, knoweth not God. Why? So in order to know God, we must both first receive love and we must what? Give love. And so when the Bible says that husbands and wives should love each other, the purpose of God in the institution of marriage is to give us an opportunity to love how many? How many? How many? Just one. Is that right? Not two, three, four, five. It's an exclusive love. One man and one woman. Is that right? Now that is to show us our relationship in loving God. How many other gods? Only one Lord we're supposed to love. One God. Is that right? And so in the marriage relation, we have the opportunity now to practice an experience that makes us know Jesus. When we receive love from our wife in an exclusive way, and when we give love to our wife in an exclusive way, it brings us to an experience where we know God in an exclusive way. Are you following me? But now, if we know that this exclusive love is to only be given to one, how will we carry on courtship? Would it be to this one and that one and then this one and that one? Or would it be a very solemn and special and holy thing? But it will be full of joy. And what is the purpose of it all? That we might, that we might know him. I want to bring it to a close in 1 Corinthians 13. What book did I say? 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Oh, that we might know him. What do you say? And let me say this to the unmarried. You don't necessarily need the institution of marriage to bring to you the object that marriage was made for. Did you know that? The object of marriage is so that we may what? To know God. That's the great purpose. This is why we have human relationships. Step to Christ says that through the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, Jesus has sought to reveal himself to us. This is the reason for husband and wife. This is the reason for father and mother. This is the reason for brother and sisters to reveal the love of God, to receive the love of God so that we know Jesus. This is why he made families. Did you know that? Do you know what a schoolmaster is that the Bible talks about? You remember that ceremonial law? The Bible calls in Galatians a schoolmaster that was to bring us to who? That was to bring us to Christ. But tell me, once the schoolmaster brought us to Christ, did we necessarily need it anymore? Do we still have to keep the ceremonial law? What happened to the ceremonial law? Why was the ceremonial You mean to tell me that ceremonial law that was given by God so that we can be brought to Jesus was done away with? Why? 1 Corinthians 13. Gives us the principle of our wife, anything that is done away that had a holy purpose, a beautiful purpose. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, notice what the Bible says. This is that great chapter of love. I think that love is very special, don't you? This is that chapter on love. Notice what it says. It says here, verse 9, for we what? We're talking about knowing Jesus. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be what what yes jesus now i understand why in principle we don't have to be marrying and given in marriage in heaven why because when that which is perfect is come that which is in part shall be done away with and what is the purpose of the institution of marriage that we may know him will there be anyone in heaven that does not know jesus no 
it would be a shame for us to simply want the schoolmaster and not who the schoolmaster was to bring us to. It would be a shame for all we wanted was a lamb when Jesus himself would come. You remember the Jews? Did they know anything about that lamb? Did they know anything about the lamb that was to be slain? They slayed the lamb. Do you know that when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, that in the temple the priest was still there doing what? Slaying the lamb. And where was the true lamb? They rejected the true to keep hold of the what? The partial. He came into his own, and his own did what? Oh, brothers and sisters, the great thing that Christ wants is for us to do what? To know him. And whether you're married or unmarried, God may not be calling everybody to marriage, but even if he's not calling you to marriage, he is calling you through human relationships to know Jesus. There are still fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, but if he's calling you to marriage, the whole purpose of it all is so that we may know Jesus. Amen? I want to close in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, oh, that we may know Jesus. I don't want you to come here and get blinded by the institution. You know, do you know why the Jews wanted to take Jesus off the cross? Do you know why? It wasn't because they loved Jesus and didn't want him to suffer anymore. They said it would break the Sabbath if we kept him on the cross through Friday evening. They were willing to try to keep the Sabbath while they crucified the Lord of the Sabbath. They failed to see past the symbol to the thing in which the symbol signified. They failed to look past the type to see his great antitype. And oh, brothers and sisters, may we not fail to see that the great glorious purpose in all of human relationships, whether it's father or mother, brother and sister, husband and wife, it is only for one purpose, that we might know him. Whether you're single or married, the same object is the same. Are you with me? But he has different ways of teaching the same lesson. And for, in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, as we close, notice what the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verses 7. Let's read it together. The Bible says, And to you who are troubled, do what? Now, brothers and sisters, I don't care what your experience has been in the past. I don't care how many problems you may have had in your marriage. I don't care how many problems you may have had singly, as a father or a mother, as a young person. I don't care what your problem is. If we come to Jesus, we can find rest, can we? He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you it says, see, it says in verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with mighty angels. And let's see, verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that what? Know not God. And that are not, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those people that will not be saved at the second coming of Jesus are simply those that what? that know not Jesus. They don't know him. But those ones that will be saved are those that this is life eternal, that we might know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. What is the design of God in the institution of marriage? That we might know him. And if we only understood that, it would correct our erroneous ideas on relationships on courtships, on every experience of life, so that in the final analysis, we know our Lord and Savior. What can be sweeter than that? You know, I, I remember when this was forcibly impressed upon my mind. My father, as I became converted, he had some old books. He didn't tell me about these books. He had some old pioneer materials that somehow, I guess, they were tucked away somewhere. And when I became converted to God, he said, well, son, I haven't used these books in years. He says, but now I think you might find interest in these books. And he pulled the books out and he showed them to me. And he said, I want to tell you something, son. He said, you're getting ready to go out. I've seen your life change. He said, you're going to get ready to go out and, as it were, do a missionary evangelistic work. And he said, son, he said, I am no longer your father. I'm listening to him. He said, you're no longer my son. He said, you're my brother. 
He said, the only reason why God put me here was to show you who the Father really was. Call no man Father but your Father in heaven. Our earthly relationships are only schoolmaster. He said, I was only to be your father until you knew who your real father really was, and now you know him. I'm no longer your father. Now I'm your brother. Were we still family? Yes. Will we be family in heaven? Yes. But the object of it all is that we might know him. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's only one thing that we need to know Jesus. And when we go down from this place, if we can know him, oh, this is life eternal. Don't you want that? Wouldn't it be a shame to know everything else? All the facts and everything else. And yet God looks at you, the one who knows everything, and he says, yeah, you prophesied in my name. You've done evangelistic efforts. You won thousands. You're telling people about this. You're showing all the reforms in diet and education and dress and music and association. Everything is wonderful, but I don't know you. Saddest of all words that ever fell on human ears is those words spoken by Jesus himself. I know you not. I know you not. I care not how old you are, how young you are. I care not what your position is, whether you're a pastor or whether you're just a visitor that has come to this meeting. Whether you want to be here or whether you don't want to be here, saddest will be the words that ever fell on human ear if you don't know Jesus. And adults and young people who have been playing with God who don't know him, that have spent their time in knowing everything else but knowing Jesus, they will wish at the last minute, but then it will be too late. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear Jesus, who knows everything, say, I don't know you. And wouldn't it be sad to get married? The design of marriage is to know him and still not know Jesus. What is the object of life? Why did you come to this meeting? Was it to find a husband or a wife? Well, if you did come that way, I pray that you'll come wanting to know Jesus. That's, that's the way you'll leave. And if we know him, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. What do you say? I want to know him, brothers and sisters. Father in heaven, may the great longing of every heart here whether single or in courtship or in marriage, may it be that we might know and love Jesus. For to know him is to love him, and to love him is to know him. This is the great object of life. It is the great object of the Sabbath. It is the great object of the institution of marriage. Oh, that we might know you, Lord. Oh, that we might be Christians in our hearts. Oh, that we might be more loving in our hearts. Father, we pray that no matter what mistakes that we have made, even up to this morning, in our relationships, in our single lives, in our marriages, in our raising of our children or as young people, may today we come to Jesus and be not troubled, but lay it all at the foot of the cross because, Lord, there is nothing in us in which we can boast. All of our glory is to be laid in the dust for it is nothing. And if we are to glory, Lord, and give glory to thee in this last hour, may it be that we understand and know you. This is what we are to glory in, that we know and understand you, dear God, that you are the Lord who exercises loving kindness. And that even in the most holy place that there is a mercy seat. And so we ask that you would have mercy upon us, O Lord. But may your mercy not lead us to presumption. May it lead us to allow your love to lift us to the highest place. For all we need to love you and to keep every commandment you've given us, and even the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, is the love of Jesus. And you have told us in John the 13th chapter and verse 17, that if we know these things, that happy are we if we do them. And happy is the home that not only knows these things, but happy is the home that practices them and does them in our daily life. May that be our experience today. 
for we ask this in the worthy name of Jesus and that you will bless all that are kneeling here in Jesus name amen